What's going on everybody? Welcome back to another Art of War stream. This time it is a review of the brand new Tau Empire Codex. Massive hype for this one and I hope you're excited because there's a lot of amazing stuff in here and we're going to break down the entire codex, all of the match play rules, and uh, we're going to go through them in detail talking about why this codex is going to be a ball of fun for every single Tau player out there. Yeah, I'm super excited for it. I mean, the codex looks gorgeous. I mean, look at this. It's got holographic Ooh, teal. That's nice. You can't even really see it because the green screen chroma keys it out. But that's it looks irrelevant. It looks like one of the premium codexes out there, let it, me tell you. It does. I want a copy of this for myself, no question. So um, I, I think it's just, I think it's going to be a ton of fun. I haven't really looked through it as much as you have, so I'm going in with more fresh eyes here. I've been just like literally glued, sniffing it, kissing it. Uh, I've been doing everything to this book. Everything? Everything and more. Everything and I'm more. I'm obsessed. So I, I know, I know. So I've been playing Tau for a long time, and every time a Tau Codex comes out, uh, there are a few people more hyped than I am. Yep, and I'm excited for Tau to be given more play styles than the one that they had, Cao Yon. I like I've played Tau in the past. I've I've yep. uh, I've played around with it. I took mm -hmm. them to WTC. Cherokee I Open. Them. I I took the Cherokee Open with them. I played I played them a, a bunch of times in ninth edition. But the tenth edition playstyle just not for me. So I am very excited to see what playstyles that Tau gets in the new book. You're going to be excited because there's some good ones in here. Uh, aggressive ones. Aggressive ones. Aggressive. Yes. Ones. So before on, no thank you, Montca. Let's go. Indeed. So before we jump in here, uh, I want to just thank everybody for joining us, and also if you're a fan of the channel or this is your first time checking us out, please do uh, check out all the other streams we put on. We put on three live streams on YouTube every single week, including a game, a tier list breaking down um, you know, some of the top 10 things in the game, like stratagems, different units. We're going to be doing unit tier lists, including one for all the units in this book, ranking each uh, against each other. And also, uh, we do a fix my list. So if you ever wanted to get into the list design process of uh, you know, a top player, get into that mindset of how do I construct an effective list, uh, definitely check out those streams. And please give us a like, subscribe to the channel, and tell your friends about us. All of that massively helps. And finally, leave a comment below letting us know what you think of our Codex review. What do you think about the new Tower Rules? And what are you most excited for? Because I'm going to read every single one of those comments. <laughs> Trust me. I, I know. I know. Very uh, diligent on that. In addition, if you want to see even more content, guess what? We're going to have so much Tau content in our War Room, the warroom.vhx.tv. There's going to be a three-day free trial, and there's a lot of games coming up against a wide variety of factions. I'm going to play in all the different attachments. So if you're hyped for Tau and you want a lot more content and seeing this book at its full potential, then uh, please do join the War Room, and uh, you're going to see so much Tau in there. Very excited for that. I know Tau is a very popular faction. Uh, speaking of which... There's going to be some reactions. There's going to be reactions. There always are. There Every single time. There always are. Let's talk about the Necron book. You and I sat for a detailed, like, two-hour review of a codex that we both thought was a gigantic improvement over the index. Yeah, we thought it was great. We thought it diversified playstyles in interesting, unique ways. And it did. And it brought some real power to the It front. really did. It's, the pro it's one of, if not the best, army at the moment. And would you happen to know what uh, what the reactions to that codex coming out were? Uh, they were extremely negative, saying that it was the end of the world, Necrons are dead, the book is terrible, all that stuff. And it's happened to other books as well, but Necrons really stood out because we were so positive about it, and people blamed us. They were like, "You got? how are you guys this positive? You know, guys are shilling for Games Workshop. And even though Games Workshop gives us these lovely codexes, we're going to give you an honest review of what we think of the variety of rules. And... Uh, I mean, that's our solemn promise for sure. If you saw my uh, and John's reaction to Codex Dark Angels coming out, or Supplement Dark Angels, whatever, you'll know we're not always positive about books uh, yeah. when they come out. But <laughs> people have a tendency, and it's a very human one, to see what is taken away and not what is given. Um, oftentimes, with these Codex, what we've seen is that they take whatever the index was doing and they diversify it, Right. That one play style generally does not exist anymore. I, I don't know about the Tau, but generally, like, the Necrons were just going to reanimate 20 Warriors on repeat. That didn't exist once the Codex came out. But a variety of other powerful, flexible play styles were introduced with the book, and people don't see that at first. That's tough to do. Um, my the, the seminal moment for me <laughs> was last edition when the Custodes Codex came out. And I looked at that codex, and I went, wow, this is a very good codex. 
I'm excited for Custodes. This codex seems really strong. And it everyone's, was. and it was, it was the best codex of, the, it was the best army when it came out. Just straight up, it was. It was the best army. Um, and and it, it swept a lot of events, and it was just doing insane things. But when it came out, people freaked out. Freaked out. Because, like, I think char- there was a couple characters that lost a 3-up invuln or some nonsense. Like, people freaked out. I saw memes of, like, Games Workshop stabbing the Custodes <laughs> army to death. <laughs> like... <laughs> It was, bar none, the most powerful codex of the edition when it came out. I mean, Games Workshop kind of went off a cliff after that. <laughs> and there were other then, more powerful... Then there, was a, then there was a Tau book. Then there was a Tau book, and then there was Eldar, and then there were Tyranids and Votan, but we don't talk about those. Um, but at the time it came out, it was the best army in the entire game, bar none, by a significant gap. And people's reactions when that came out was that the army was dead. So I anticipate that there, the exact same thing will happen... With Tau. There are definitely some things that are nerfed in here. Some things are just changed as entirely different, and we need to take a different perspective on them. And and then there's going to be some things that are bad in here. But there's a lot of really good stuff, and frankly, I am extremely positive about this book. My honest, solemn opinion is that this is a big upgrade for Tau, and it is going to be a big boost for a lot of players who struggled with Kalyan. The alternate playstyles in here are genuinely going to be a big boost to the flexibility of the average Tau player. Very Um, excited for that. And uh, again, if you want to see us not being very positive about a book, you can check out our Dark Angels review and our AdMech review, where we (laughs) do not sugarcoat it. Yep, and anything in here that we don't like, we will tell you. Uh, We will be very honest. So once again, thanks to Games Workshop for giving us these books in advance and letting us review them. And uh, we just really appreciate that. We're going to be getting those new crew on stream as soon as we can. And uh, I know Nick has promised a Tau versus Tau mirror matchup crew on Tau. That's a, <laughs> that will happen sometime in the future, but he, he, shook, he shook my hand on stream. we got to do it. Yeah, you, you have to. <laughs> uh, to clarify, we have not actually played any games with this. We have not gotten it with enough time to play games. Yep. Um, so this is That's going to true. be... Yeah, this is going to be our I have your been. like third or fourth impression with the book. This is going to be my second. I glanced through it, and I have very hazy memories of what's yeah. in it. Um, so, if you do want a text version of this review, uh, Jack and I are going to be giving our opinions here in this video review for Art of War, and then I also wrote a text review for Goonhammer that is also going to be worth checking out. Absolutely. So let's get right into it. Let's dive right in here. So So the army rule, has that changed at all? That has not changed. It is effectively the same exact thing. Your units work in pairs in order to one unit's an observer, and it looks at a particular target uh, from your opponent, and that's going to be the spotted target, and then your other unit that you want to buff, the guided unit, gets a bunch of variety of benefits. And the thing to remember is that the exploding sixes or double exploding sixes if you're guided um, from turn three on, that was from the Kalyan detachment. So that's not an inherent part of being guided. Being guided just gives you plus one ballistic skill, and if the guided unit has or guiding unit has marker light, ignore cover. Yep, that observer unit if it has the marker light keyword, you get the ignores cover. Um, and they did keep one of the things I really didn't like about this rule was it really punished a split fire, and that penalty is still in here. If you shoot, if you if any of the models in the unit target the um, anything but the spotted unit, they take minus one ballistic skill, which because a lot of Tau units have a variety of weapons on them, they have like one, you know, anti-elite infantry, you know, type of weapon or an anti-tank gun, and then they have, you know, like a couple gun drones or some burst cannons. This rule really punishes using those efficiently, which yes. I don't quite like. I, yeah, I don't love that. I mean, the smaller crisis suit units, which we'll, we'll get to, the smaller crisis well, suit spoilers, units. Spoilers, Jack. <laughs> Uh, smaller, more specialized You're break crisis the internet suit. Right now. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> smaller, more specialized crisis suit units um, definitely don't feel that as bad as like the six man. That as soon as the six man pointed at something that wasn't its guided unit, it's just, like its efficiency fell off a cliff. Yeah, and I think that's fine for like the big unit that all has mostly the same weapons. I was more, I'm more concerned with something like a storm surge where it has a oh, twin yeah. airburst. It's got <laughs> some, you know the cluster missiles. It has a wide variety of profiles. And they want to be going into different things, and you're punished for wanting to do that, which I quite, I really don't like. So I wish they would just delete that. I, I don't think this needs to exist, frankly. Yeah, that could be. That I could don't be think true. they need such a harsh downside for splitting. 
So that it's here. You're going to have to deal with it. And uh, there are plenty of ways to playing an MSU style is certainly rewarded so that you just focus down things with certain units. Yep. Or having homogenous weapon profiles. So you all want to go into one target. The main issue, as you were pointing out, is like if you have a gun that wants to shoot a tank and you have a gun that wants to shoot infantry, they don't want to, to shoot. Like you don't want your two-shot anti-tank gun to fire at crude, right? You don't yeah. want that. And you don't want your anti-infantry gun to shoot at a tank. So any any like unit that has some of each is going to be bad with one of them. Yeah. Now, you know, you could just not guide the unit and then you can split and you don't have a penalty, but you also don't get plus one ballistic skill or Which ignore cover. So it's nice. It's not awesome. But okay. anyway, plus one ballistic skill is still amazing for this army. It really needs it for the efficiency of the offense. Um, then the drones. Drones have effectively remained the same except for one change, which is that the missile drone is now AP1 like the other, the missile pods. So they used to be, AP, the missile drone was AP2 for some reason and missile pods were AP1. They have uh, instead just made them all AP1. I think someone just wasn't paying attention when they when they hit the button. Yep, there was, there was a bunch of those in here. I, I think it was just a or typo. In the uh, index. It. So everything else the same, shield drones plus one boon, the uh, marker light, you can get marker light keyword in advance and uh, still do it. And then gun drones are uh, still have assault and, and twin linked and all that stuff. Guardian drone is fantastic at that minus one wound against range attacks. Yep, that's uh, just... It's just a good rule. It's very hard to deal with um, breachers and stuff when they have that. Kalyan. All right, so, so we're getting to the detachments. We have, there's four, four. here. We have Kalyan, Montka, Retaliation Cadre, which is really cool, and Crute Hunting Pack, which is also really cool. Yep, so four detachments, um, and one of those is the pre-existing one, although it has changed in some important ways. So it looks like so the Kalyan Patient Hunter rule, mm -hmm. You get sustained hits one from third battle round onwards. Yep. And you get sustained hits two instead while targeting their unit's spotted unit. Which is different than the previous version, just slightly, but importantly, previously it was you get sustained two if the unit was guided. Didn't matter what you were targeting. So you could go ahead, guide the unit against one particular target, and this was very common for six crisis suits, is you put like all the fusion into one target, and then the commander would split off. He'd take minus a ballistic skill, but because the unit was guided, you would get sustained two on him, and it would make up for the fact that of that minus one ballistic skill. Yeah. Uh, now you only get it against the spotted target. But you do get sustained one against everything else. If you do split, you still get sustained one. Mm -hmm. um, that's all right. I mean, Kalyan has always been the come from behind detachment, yeah. right? It's just it was the only one that Tau had. It was the first two battle rounds is Tau trying to manage. Slow down the enemy, mitigate, move, block, kill what you can, tie things up. But it was really about delay. Because, yeah. Because turn two, you had uh, Exemplar of the Kalyon, which you, you still have. Um, so turn two, at least one of your units could get max efficiency. And then once turn three happened, your opponent was on a clock. Because they would be just dead from that point on. Your army was just way too efficient. Yeah, it, it was insane amount of shots. You'd have 12 shots from a cyclic commander. You'd have the breachers with 20 shots or 30 if they had the yep. character and just blow everything and up. And once you have sustained two, it's like 20 shots, 30 hits. Yeah, re-rolls. Um, so, Kalyan has always been, and still is, about delay first two turns, try not to lose early, and then try to come back, which... As far as game plans for 40k goes, not the best. It's not the best in 10th edition, and it's very hard to pull off. And I think this is one of the biggest reasons that Tau has a big gap between veteran Tau players, experienced Tau players, and everybody else, if you look on the stat check win rates. Yeah. If you deploy on the line against Tau, because they couldn't punish it, really, because they didn't have Fire and Fade, although they don't have Fire and Fade now, they didn't have Fire and Fade active on turn one, so you just deployed on the line, because if they shot you, they were getting in a shooting war with Kalyan not active, because uh, they couldn't leave. So you deploy on the line against Tau, and if you just get first turn, run at them, there is, they really have to dig themselves out of the hole. And armies that are good turns one, two, and three, like orcs usually, uh, tend to be more rewarded by 10th edition than armies that are good once the tenor of the game has been set already. Yeah, it feels like, like this harkens back to like 8th edition when there was a six turn game. This would be a very powerful rule because you'd have that full extra turn to benefit. Yep. And it just, the this turn two is so significant in 10th edition. You need to be able to really put a lot of pressure on your opponent if they try and rush you. 
Yeah. And Tao struggled to do that in a lot of ways. Yeah, and having first versus second turn is actually kind of huge for Tao. Mm -hmm. Because if I have first turn against the Tao, against Kalyon, and I push on turn two, their retaliation push into me is going to happen on turn two before they have Kalyon up. Yep. If I push on my turn two and I'm bottom of turn, right? So if I go first, I hit them, they hit me back without Kalyon, and I hit them again and hopefully can drive their face into the dirt enough then we're good. If I'm going second as the into the Tau, and I move up on turn one, and I hit them on turn two, the retaliation hit is going to come with Kalyon, and that's a completely different animal. Yep. <laughs> um, so, you know, and the go first the go first power out of Tau against aggressive armies was pretty pretty huge. If they went first, or if the opponent went first, it was a completely different game, yeah. just because of the turn Kalyon would trigger. So in terms of the enhancements here, um, one of them is gone, the Puritide Engram chip, which, don't worry, it was completely terrible, and uh, it's moved to a different detachment. So they instead get Solid Image Projection Unit, which is a redeploy. Uh, you can pick uh, three Tau units and redeploy them, but it's not after you know who's going first. It's before. So because of that, eh, it's not that amazing. I don't think you're going to be seeing it too often, but if you're a big fan of, you know, trying to play a Super MSU style and see where your opponents deployed things, you could try and take advantage of it or put more things into strategic reserve. Yeah. But frankly, I don't think Tau needs it that much. Yeah, I mean, the trying to out mind game your opponent on deployment is so pointless that oftentimes I will just deploy my whole army at once and tell my opponent to go. <laughs> yeah. Tell my opponent to start deploying. Yeah. Because uh, it, it doesn't matter, like, very little. Occasionally it does. There's not. You can absolutely come up with times and it does, but, like, most of the time it doesn't. Yeah, most of the time it doesn't, so... Not that, not that impactful there. Exemplar of the Kalyan remains exactly the same, where you get Kalyan on that unit turn two onward, which is nice. That's very good. And then Precision of the Patient Hunter, same thing, plus one to hit, and then third battle round onward, plus one to wound. Also very good. Yep, very solid on your commanders. And then three unity devastation, same thing if a that character who has it is leading a unit, so it has a very niche uh, type of units that can actually access it in the first place the um, guided unit gets lethal hits. Yeah, the crew shapers can't even get it, so like yeah. that narrows it down even more. <laughs> exactly. So you basically take like a fire blade with it and put in a breacher squad. But at the end of the day, you're giving up other very good guided benefits, and you basically never saw it. So their enhancements are, frankly, um, they got... If you run the crisis unit, which you may not now because of some stratagem changes, then you would probably run exempt for the Calium, but it's still pretty solid on a breacher squad as well. I, I think so, having something that can go full damage on turn two is pretty important for Kalyon, so I think you would still run it. Yep, I think that's still the one that you would take, and then the second one would be Precision of the Patient Hunter. Just put that on the commander, and because they still get cyclics. <laughs> that's the sound you make when you shoot people they with cyclics. They get a cyclic. They get, they get one cyclic? I'll show you. <laughs> okay, well, data sheet changes. <laughs> <laughs> but they can still, you can still put a lot of volume of fire on a commander. Okay. Uh, that isn't cyclic, so don't, don't worry. Cool, cool. Uh, but it's still good on them. Then we have attempting target, so stratagems. Like, two are gone. And one is stim injectors, which buffed your battle suit units for six of Fiona Pain. It's in a different detachment now. And uh, strike and fade is gone. That's a big one. It is a big one. Now, we had seen in the last, like, couple months uh, with the new data slate, Tau shift to non-crisis builds in Kalyan that were having quite good success. I know you've been meta. shifting to a non-crisis builds as well. It, it's a 500, you know, it's 400 points for six model, six, six crisis models, plus 125 for the commander with the enhancement. Plus two CP every turn. Plus two CP. It's a huge investment every single time, and its damage output is very good into, like, single big things, but not as good into, I have 10 units that are all really important. Like, I know if I played Custodes into that, you just pick up a brick every turn, no and, questions and you asked. you hate that, yeah. No questions that. asked. But, like, my Orc MSU build into you... Or with, Chaos Knights. Or Chaos Knights was very much able to overwhelm you with quantity of units, transports, things like that. That unit's terrible into that. Exactly. So it had weaknesses, um, but it was also very strong in certain matchups, especially because your opponent couldn't in interact with it. So it's gone here. Which means I think the MSU style of Kalyan that was prospering recently will remain the way to play this detachment going forward. So use Kalyan to get massive damage on MSU units rather than taking one big unit and exploiting strike and fade every turn. Yeah, exactly. And the force change to crisis suits to make them three mans, which we'll get to, is uh, something that this detachment doesn't mind as much now. I wish they'd put something in Kalyan for like flame weapons, like flamers get plus one uh, hit. It's not like flame plus weapon. One hit. Plus, plus one attack, you mean? 
Plus one shot? Plus one hit when you roll them. Like, it's D6 oh, yeah, hits. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay. That's what I meant. But, yeah, like, plus one shot or plus two shots if you're in carry on turn because they don't get any benefit from it. And it's not like flamers are blowing the world up or whatever. No. It, it could just say torrent weapons get plus two shots on turn three. Yeah, that would, be, that would be a nice little uh, thing they could yeah. add. So it's let's not, go... like, important or anything. Just interesting. Let's go through these strats. So the two new ones are tempting target. Uh, this is one CP. It is a battle tactic. So uh, in your shooting phase, one Tau unit from your army that hasn't been selected. The first time you use the strat, you select one objective marker on the battlefield that's not in your opponent's deployment zone. So you're probably picking one of the midfield ones. And until the end of the phase, when you use the strat, each time a model in your unit that you've selected makes a ranged attack against an enemy within range of that objective marker, the trap objective marker, then you get plus one to wound. So when you use the strat for the first time, which cannot be on turns one or two. Yes. Um, when you use the strat for the first time, you pick an objective, and then every time after that you use the strat, it has to be that objective. Yep, but you that get plus one to wound against it. very interesting design, um, and it's pretty good, too. I really just don't like everything being restricted to about around three onward. I think having your main thing restricted is already a lot. I don't think more things should be restricted. Like, I think the precision should just be plus one to plus one to wound, yeah. period. I think this should be, you use it whenever. It shouldn't be, hey, you only have a detachment for turns three on. Yeah. I, you just don't have it. Close the book. You will not need it. Don't have a detachment for turns one and two. Yeah. So that's a big miss because plus one to wound against like threat overload type of armies in the middle of the table is quite good. When they put something durable like a katan on there, just be like, okay, my breachers who have the fire blade are going, you know, it's turn two. I've got example of a Kalyan breacher unit. Plus one to wound against it. Full rerolls to wound. I'm actually going to put quite a bit of damage in there. Yeah, you can't do it though, unfortunately. You can't do it can't because do it, it restricts it. So you have to wait till turn three. No, no. I mean, at the very least, it should say while they're under the effects of like the patient hunter rule or something, because that way, example of the Kalyan could turn on a lot of these things. But yeah, so that's a miss there. Uh, point ang point blank ambush um, is also a battle tactic. It's the plus one EP. It remains exactly the same. You can't use it uh, in the first or second battle rounds either. Again, cannot emphasize enough how the how much the tone of the game is set by turn two. Turn one is usually staging, but if the game is going to kick off, turn two is what is what solidifies like the path the game is going to take from there yeah. on out. Exactly. And not having any control over that or any buffs to your control over that is definitely a problem. <laughs> it's a problem, and it was a problem. <laughs> so uh, next one is coordinate to engage, also a battle tactic. I'm mentioning battle tactic because it interacts with the data slate. If you're not familiar and a newer player, do check out the data slate uh, in order to uh, use a strat a second time or to modify its command point cost. It must be a battle tactic, so that's why I'm mentioning it. Okay. Um, this stratagem remains exactly, pretty much the same, is that when you're one of the units that's being an observer to try and buff you know, the guided unit, you can also get the benefit of plus one ballistic skill and ignores cover if you have that marker like you keyword. will not get um, you will not get sustained two. No. But you do get the mark you get do get ignores cover and plus one ballistic skill and sustain one, exactly. which is usually enough. It's it's a solid buff. I, I both basically never use it, but it's it's there. <laughs> I've seen it occasionally come yeah, up. Yeah, it's very occasional. Yeah. Then you have combat embarkation. This is something that's very strong in the MSU variant to keep your breachers alive. So it's used in your opponent's charge phase. You pick a Tau infantry unit that was uh, declared as a charge target. And if you have an empty transport and all your models are within three of it, you can get inside if there's capacity, which keeping breachers alive against some of these aggressive charging armies is very, very strong. Yes. And I've been using it quite heavily in my more recent builds. Mm -hmm. uh, so that one remains the same. Photon grenades, basically the same as well. It's Battleshock test minus two to charge uh, when they declare it against your grenades unit. But it's different. The one thing that's different now is the restriction. You can't target a unit um, that's within an engage range with this strat. So if your breachers are already engaged, they charge some like nonsense unit into oh, you first. Oh, I see. You're I see, in engagement see. range now, and then they charge something important. You can't then be like, okay, now I'm going to use it. <laughs> one dude on the end throws a grenade. Yeah. Yeah, no. Okay, so there's, there's counterplay to it. I don't think it's like incredible counterplay. Having to set up a second unit to charge into like breachers is yeah. not really where I want to be, but... <laughs> no, so it's still a very good strat, but yeah. it has one new restriction. And then the last one is also new. It's Wall of Mirrors. It is a battle tactic as well, so quite a few battle tactics in this one. End of your opponent's fight phase, one stealth, a ghost keel, or commander shadow sun. So you're basically normal stealthy units. They can go into strategic reserves. 
um, as long as they are not engaged range of any enemy units at the end of your uh, opponent's fight phase. That is very good. That is a very good one. Uh, so here's where it's going to be super useful is first, for your stealth suits, they're going to be one of the best observers in this new Tau book because they got a really nice enhancement. They are now, for their observer benefit, reroll ones to hit and ones to wound yeah, instead of just ones to wound. You're going to see a lot more stealth suits right now. They are highly competitive with Tetras now. So because of that, being able to redeploy them to a new angle for the following turn is super nice. Or they can go do mission play in their backfield plus observe for something. So this is a very good stratagem. Uh, Shadow Sun redeploying her six-inch aura of reroll ones to hit is also quite nice if you're playing the two flanks of the board. And then Ghost Kills, you could be annoying with loan ops in different places now. Yes. So I, can tell, do they have Deep Strike? Uh, they do not have. I don't believe the Ghost Kill oh, or oh. the Stealth Suits have Deep Strike. I will just uh, just check. They certainly have Infiltrate, but I'm pretty sure they don't have Deep Strike. Okay. Yeah, I don't. I don't think there was much call to do it before, so I don't know. Let me find them. But this means you, your mission play is dramatically better in the late game now. You don't have to run Vespids at all because your stealth suits can go back up. If you just pick up stealth suits, send them around the board. None of them have deep strike. Yep. I don't know if Shadow Sun does, but I, I doubt it. I don't believe so. She does not. Yeah. So, so, but they can still go around the edges of the board, score the secondaries. A ghost kill, even like having one in your army, just like your opponent puts some nonsense on an objective, you pick your unit up, you go over there, and you blow up that nonsense, is pretty helpful. Legitimately is a good thing that you would not be able to do otherwise, yep. so that is nice. So, at the end of the day, so that's Kalyan. Um, my personal opinion is that this is probably going to be the third most seen uh, detachment. Frankly, probably. I, I think Monka and uh, the Retaliation Contra that we're going to go through uh, next, I think they're both stronger than this. I think this playstyle is so limiting and just doesn't fit with 10th edition as it's currently played. It's very hard to get a lot of value out of this detachment. You have to play very, very carefully in a lot of tough matchups, and it is possible. It's been done by, by the top Tau players. But it's you're you're having to play a much tougher game than a lot of other armies do. I also think they've pulled a lot of the reason to want to be in this detachment out of it and put it in other detachments, and that means that you don't necessarily want to be counting on anymore. Like fire and fade, legitimately was very good, but it's the, one of the best strats. <laughs> one of the best strats, and it was very helpful for Kalyon. The problem is, uh, it's not there anymore. It is in the retaliation cadre, so. I, yeah, I also don't see much reason, reason to be Kalyon. If you want to dig yourself out of a hole every game, they will throw you a shovel, right? You will have a shovel. You can dig yourself out. But, like, that's I don't want to be in a hole to start. <laughs> you don't want to start in the hole. <laughs> I don't want to start in the hole. I want to start out of the hole, and I want to put my opponent in the hole. <laughs> and then they can dig their way out of it. Yeah. So, unfortunately, I just... There is some interesting stuff here. I just don't think it fits with the current version of 10th edition very well. Yep. And you have to work extra hard as the Tau player to get the value out of this. Yep. And now there are other options. You can pick those other options, and it's good. And we're hey. going to start with one of them. Yep. <laughs> Monka, baby. It's got a picture of Farsight here. It looks badass. Man, so... I loved picking Monka with the old book just every time. Just Monka. Even when they nerfed Monka, I was just like... Man, I want assault on my guns. I just like Monka. I just like I just like Monka. Well, let's go ahead and talk about the killing blow, which is their detachment roll. So during the first, second, and third battle rounds. Oh so yeah, I like that the, a lot better. This is the reverse. Uh, the ranged weapons equipped by Tau models just have lethal hits. Period. Which Tau is one of those armies that, for the most part, doesn't have too many amazing anti-tank weapons. Making all of your weapons all of a sudden lethal is quite solid. And then while the unit is guided. Its ranged weapons have assault as well. Now there is a little oopsie here in that when you, in order to get the guided benefit, you need to select a unit to shoot. And so if you don't have assault yet and you advanced and don't have assault weapons, you can't actually access this. So whoever wrote this didn't quite understand uh, how sequencing works in 10th edition. However, I expect them to FAQ that to make it work. I frankly think that they should just switch you just get assault, period, for being Tau with your ranged weapons, and then lethal hits on the guided unit. And that's just a clean swap right there. But I don't know what they're going to do. I have no idea. I don't even know if anybody has realized this at Games Workshop. Probably they have. Yeah, I mean, there's two ways this can go, right? It's basically going to come down to what do TOs do. 
GTOs say, sorry, you have to have an assault weapon that will turn all the rest of your weapons assault, basically. Yeah. I think most of the time people would just be like, we know what it's trying to do here. Yeah, we know they're trying to give assault to all the different weapons that don't have it. Yeah. But uh, there is a little technical whoopsie, so I expect that to be FAQ'd pretty quickly. Um, and uh, Or you can just play the retaliation card. I'm going to assume this detachment works. Uh, so <laughs> yes. I'm going to assume you get assault if you're guided, which is very strong. So let's dive into the enhancements here. Obviously, all of this is new. So Exemplar of the Monka. Very similar to Exemplar of the Kalyan is when the bear is leading the unit, you get the Killing Blow Detachment rule in the fourth battle round. I think this is not great for the same reason that Exemplar of the Kalyan is really good. Yep. <laughs> uh, fourth battle round and second battle round, not equal. Nope, not the same thing. And the fact is that you also don't get the fifth battle round. <laughs> like, if this gave the fourth and fifth, I'd be like, okay, there, there might be some reason, although I might not get value out of it every game, but only the fourth battle round, like... You also don't know if that's the unit that's going to make it to the fourth battle round. It probably um, won't, because it's probably going to be used at some point. Yep. If you have, like, three units of Crisis, right, one of them has this enhancement. The odds it makes it to the end of the game, makes it two turn four, is, like, one in three. Yeah. Because <laughs> that section of the board might be the one that has to fight, and oops, they're dead now. This is a miss, for sure. But don't worry. All right, next up we have Strike Swiftly, and if you're a World Eaters player, you'll remember that there's something like this in their book. Start of the battle before any moves are made using Scout's ability. You select up to two friendly Tau Empire units within six that don't have Scouts. Till the end of the battle, all models selected have Scout six. Yes. Why is this good? Well, Tau already have Scout in a couple of places and infiltrate in a bunch of places. This is very impactful on Devilfish. And previously, in order to access Scout moves on Devilfish, you had to put Pathfinders inside. Now, you can actually put Breachers inside those Devilfish and send the Breacher Fish up early. Uh, which Breachers typically do more damage than Pathfinders because of the real wounds on objectives, and they're also higher OC, so they're better for contest plays, and they're amazing at contesting in this detachment when we get to some of the strats. So this is a nice mobility boost. Now you can also have your Pathfinders, because Pathfinders are good in general. You could have Pathfinders and one Devilfish, two other Devilfish with Breachers, all of it scouts up. Yep. And your forward pressure can be quite immense. Yes, I... Yeah, I mean, Scout is a really good rule. It's just moving a fat, getting a fast moving thing already basically in the middle of the board automatically is strong. Breachers are also really strong. Devilfish are really, really good at carrying breachers around. So if you can scout, um, yeah, because you can pick the, the devilfish to gain scout. Exactly. And then it scouts six, then it moves how far? 12. 12. Gets the guys out if you want and shoots your opponent. You won't do that most of the time, but the fact that you can makes your opponent have to play a lot more cagely. Yeah, you can advance and disembark too. Yes. So, like, the, the speed on this is amazing. And the other thing is Devilfish are quite large of models. And so if you deploy them on your deployment edge, there's going to be firing angles to them. If you can then scout move a bunch of Devilfish all up into an area where now it's much harder to get angles to them, that is a way to run more than, like, I found, like, two you can pretty safely hide, but anything more was quite difficult. This uh, enhancement opens up running more of them. It might let you run up to, like, four of them, It yeah. really would. Because you get two into the center of the board hidden, two in your deployment zone hidden, and you can actually, like, go second without losing a bunch yeah. of material. Or you do two with this, two with Pathfinders inside, and they all go up. Yeah, that so, too. I think there's a lot of flexibility with this. I think this one is quite solid. The next one is, is Sweet Sauce. This is automatic, and you might look at it and not think that, but I'm going to explain exactly why. So at the start of the first battle round, before the first turn begins, you pick one objective marker on the battlefield. While a friendly Tau model is within range of that objective marker and the bearers on the battlefield, add one to that friendly model's OC characteristic. Okay, why is this important, Jack? Well, first of all, it means that your breachers pop out onto that objective 30 OC. Right it's there. a lot. <laughs> 30 OC. Your Devilfish are 3 OC. Your Piranhas are 3 OC. Um, you've got a wide variety of things that are awkward um, numbers of OC, like Riptides go from 4 to 5, Ghost Keels go 3 to 4. So you, you pick the middle objective, and that's the one that's most likely to be contested over the course of the game. And anytime you do, now it gets way easier. Even better than that, Jack. If a unit gets battle shocked and goes to OC 0, there's still OC1. You then add, you use the rules commentary to add one after it's modified to zero, so you still control the objective. So against Tyranids, you pick your safe expansion objective, <laughs> and that means no matter how much battle shock they apply, you're still holding the objective. Yep. 
um, which is nice. But wait, there's more. Crude hounds are typically OC zero. They have a rule. <laughs> they have a, they have a rule. In the, they have, you see where I go with this? Oh yeah. They have a rule where if they're nearby friendly carnivores, I believe they get plus one OC. What if we didn't have to do that though? What if you didn't have to do that and they can just you can send four cheap dudes out onto an objective and be like, boom, plus one. You OC. wonder how many points this is? Fifteen. It's cheap. Yeah, yeah. It's in every single mod call list that I've written. I have to. We don't know exactly how point values will 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 go, right? Because yep. these are definitely not current with the MFM. These are from the like most of these are the index points for Tau. A lot of them are the index points. I would assume any new units are going to have price points close to where they are in the book because they're new. They haven't GW hasn't messed with them yet because they haven't seen them in live action. So I assume that when the MFN comes out for this, this is me assuming, I do not know. <laughs> um, I assume the new units will have points cost similar, if not exactly the same to where they are in the book. Yeah, and Everything that already has an MFN points cost, I would assume stays with that MFN points cost. The enhancements, my guess, will stay the same. Yeah, and they, they have basically very rarely changed, even through multiple data slates. Like a couple have changed, but almost all of them have remained exactly the same. And this thing is straight up automatic. It is ludicrously strong. 15 points, that is one of the best, one of the best enhancements in the game. It's extremely It's very good. good. It's very, very, very good. good. So the shenanigans are, are endless, and I'm a big, big fan of this. <laughs> and this is why I think this detachment is extremely strong for the current MSU style of Tau. There also are generally only five objectives on a board. And of those five objectives, three are up for grabs. So like every turn unless you are trouncing your opponent. So this is very good. This gives you really good control of one of the three objectives in No Man's Land. And if we're all being honest with each other, we're probably not contesting either the natural expansions of either player, which is the objective directly above your deployment zone. Um, so what that means is the objective that is the most flippy, the one in the center, that's the one you're way better than your opponent at controlling. Yeah, and imagine, really good. imagine they go into their breacher unit, you know, they flub their their swings and four guys survive, 12 OC. Yep, it's my objective, sorry. <laughs> Ouch. And you're minus one to wound. and yeah, it's just Not a, in combat, but yeah. Yeah, yeah, but this is really good. Like, this legitimately is very good. Straight up automatic if you run this detachment. Then we have coordinated exploitation. It is very similar to uh, through unity devastation. You pick a unit, you pick a model, gets the enhancement. If it's leading a unit, then if it, that unit that it's leading acts as an observer, the guided unit gets sustained one. Well, I do like that a lot. Coordinated exploitation, 20 points, just handing sustained hits to a unit every turn. I do like that. Yeah, so you basically, once again, probably putting it on a fire blade in a breacher unit, and it's going to support some other killer. Yeah. Okay, so that's the enhancements. So Those are very good. It's a very solid suite. I think three of them are legitimately, you know, just very much you want to be thinking about taking them. Yep. Yeah. Then we've got stratagems. So all of these are new, obviously. We've got pinpoint counter offensive, which is a battle tactic. It is one CP and can be used in any phase. One Tau Empire unit, excluding crew, from your army that was just destroyed. You can use the strat on them, even though they're dead. Till the end of the battle, each time a Tau Empire unit from your army, not crew, makes an attack that targets that enemy unit, you reroll hits against it. <laughs> one CP reroll hits. For all your units that target it. Until the end of the battle. So that's the, real good. Their Catan kills something, and you're just like, no problem. <laughs> real hits. <laughs> you have to be proactive with it, but yeah. man, Votan eat your heart out, you know? Yes. This is very, very good. Then we have another amazing stratagem. 1CP aggressive mobility used in your movement phase. That's my also, favorite kind. Also a battle tactic. One Tau Empire unit, so it can include crew. Till the end of the phase, if your unit advances, you just add six to your move characteristic. That's pretty good, because you advance and shoot. Yes, and uh, being able to disembark your breachers three inches from the Devilfish, move six, additional six from this, you can guarantee contest a lot of things from a forward midfield position. We are thinking of this in slightly different ways. <laughs> but you can I'm also get angles the... with shooting. <laughs> yes. I I'm getting there, but like, this is... I'm just, breachers I'm just, are so good. They are. Breachers are incredible. I'm just talking about how like the different ways our minds look at that. You're like, I'm going to run up and I'm going to contest an objective automatically. And I'm like, my opponent is going to die so hard. Broadsides are the biggest beneficiary of this. Yeah. So if the assault works in the detachment, which I'm going to assume it does, then being able to just be like 11 inches to this firing angle, you're dead. Yeah. 
big, big deal for slower guns. Yeah, and mobility has always been better on slower units because they, you know, if a slower unit moves an extra five inches, that's doubling its speed. Uh -huh. Whereas if something that moves 12 inches goes five extra inches or six extra inches or whatever, that's 50% better. Now, there is a little bit of sauce here in terms of Commander Farsight. His new data sheet rule, spoiler, is uh, he can make a strat free once per battle round. That's pretty good. This and is a battle tactic. That's a battle tactic. So his rule, he, his other rule is still the plus one to wound within nine inches. So you can just be like, my unit moves up. I'm within nine now. Boom. Uh, you're dead. So you can have a very aggressive piece with Farsight that can always get within nine quite easily. It seems pretty good. Which is nice. All right. Focused fire. Also a very good stratagem. Start of your shooting phase. It's battle tactic. One CP. Two Tau units from your army uh, that haven't been selected to shoot. Till the end of the phase, each time they uh, target one particular enemy unit, they get plus one AP. It's pretty good. Can't use it during turns four or five. Don't. Don't care. I'm not going to say I don't care, but I, I, I'm I not factoring that in here. <laughs> <laughs> so your breachers <laughs> can once again get very easy access to AP2. Reroll wounds on objectives. Yeah, plus one AP for turns one, two, and three is a lot better than plus one AP for... Mm -hmm. For turns yeah. three, four, and five. <laughs> also, this is one CP, and you get two it's units. Two units. This is the Admex strat, but one CP. I and do. can be used on more things. It's a very good ability. It's a very good ability. So, like, Also, there's no range restriction. No. You just get plus one AP. <laughs> Damn! <laughs> no range restriction. Nope. Interesting decisions here. <laughs> this is good. All right. Okay. It's not the end of good. So we got one CP combat. Are all of these battle tactics? My god, there's four. There's four. The first detachment also had four. Focus Fire now probably does not work with a free strat because it targets two units, but whatever. Yeah. I mean, that's probably what we've had, to be honest with you. Yeah. Carrying on to combat debarkation. Okay, we got one Tau infantry unit that just disembarked from a transport. It gets reroll wounds against the closest enemy unit. So this is a way to get reroll wounds on breachers not on an objective. Or, if you shoot all your breachers at stuff on objectives, you could have your pathfinders that disembark reroll wounds now. And they get three cyclic ions uh, in their unit, plus other things. Or a crisis unit? Or Well, how are they disembarking from a transport? Fair. <laughs> They're also not an infantry unit. So, <laughs> moving on. <laughs> but pathfinders can do it. Breachers can shoot things that aren't, that aren't uh, on an objective. Exactly. One CP, mild restrictions, reroll wounds, very good. Yep, just, it, it really means that your infantry are going to punch through when they need to, which is very nice. Um, and this makes me, in the list that I've written for this detachment, I really like the Cadre Fireblade in Breachers because there's these type of strats that mean you can really punch up damage on non-objective units. It's a big weakness of things like Immortals where they really want their enemy to put the key units on objectives. And you're, as soon as they don't do that, now I'm like, I'll still get you. Yeah, your opponent's just like, so you're saying... <laughs> You're saying you're good against, if I'm on this funny circle, you're good at killing me. Yeah. <laughs> Slightly off of it. Just behind. <laughs> uh, and now I'm like, I don't care. I'm, I'm getting it. Yeah, you put something nonsensical on the objective that your opponent could kill regardless, right? That they don't need the rerolls to kill. And then your tough thing is like just off it. Um, and then if your opponent exposes their unit to hit the weak thing, you counterpunch them. And if they don't, then, then they don't and you have the objective. <laughs> So, so the last two strats, so all those strats are one CP, which is great because you want to be using them multiple times. Then you have two more stratagems. One is strategic ploy, which is pulse onslaught, and it's two CP. Your shooting phase, you pick a Talion Fire infantry unit um, that targets uh, one enemy unit that, that is not a monster or a vehicle. And as long as you hit, till the end of your opponent's next turn, they're minus two to move, advance, and charge rolls. Yep, and you use this after you're done shooting. So if you shoot at a unit and see that it lived and you're like, oh, that's bad, you can be like, stop, like, stop moving. No. <laughs> um, now it's two CP, so it is quite pricey. And not a battle tactic. A lot of infantry stuff is going to be, or infantry amount is gonna be likely behind terrain first. So this really matters if you don't expect to kill it, but you want to deep, you know, you send your devilfish, you advance out, drop your breachers to contest an objective and you put some damage on it, then you decide it's not going to hit any of my other units. Yeah, it's all right. It's good to have. One CP would have meant it was just you see it all the time and it's miserable to play against. Two CP probably means you don't see it very much. Yeah, I think two CP is a little too pricey for it. But this would be a prime candidate for a 1.5 CP cost. <laughs> 
um, unfortunately. Uh, yeah, so I don't think we'll see it too often, but it could come up in situations where you just really need to debuff this one particular thing. Then the last one is also 2 CP, it's War Gear Strat Counter Defense Systems. Your opponent's shooting phase, after they select a target, you pick one Tau Empire unit, so it could be anything, minus one damage. So What? Hold on, just in shooting, but yes. Yep, just minus one damage, so you can minus one damage a Devilfish, a Ghost Keel, a Riptide, any of the Tau Nar, doesn't matter. You could just minus one damage it. That is solid. That is quite solid. It yes. is pricey, but when you really need to keep something alive or like force them to put so much damage into it, this is the way to do it. Yeah, absolutely. So that is Monka. My overall impression of Monka is quite positive. I think Monka uh, absolutely outcompetes Kalyon because yes. it interacts <laughs> yeah. with the key uh, early turns. And you get that additional mobility. So slower guns, slower units overall benefit a lot. And I think this this uh, suite of stratagems and the enhancements really support the MSU mission style of your opponent doesn't get primary in the middle of the table. Yeah, yeah, I, I think it's I think it's pretty good. It's also pretty good at um, just making you go quick and hit hard early in the game and try to push your opponent, if not out of the game, at least out of the game for the early running. Mm -hmm. And then maybe they come back late, although you're still, like you're still how you still shoot, right? It's not like orcs where they're made out of, where they have t-shirts and yeah. you know, funny war cries. You're still, you still have riptides and vehicles and stuff for when the game goes late, but they, but you shove your opponent out of the middle and then they try to work their way back into it and then by the time they succeed, the game has ended and they, it's like, oh, I haven't scored any points. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> where those points go? Where'd they go? They're just over there. I could just see them. Okay, last up for the non-crew detachments is the Retaliation Cadre, and if you were a fan of battle suits, this is... Yes! This is the detachment. Dude, I'm so excited for this detachment. Like, legitimately very excited for this detachment. Also, if I were to play Tau, which is not impossible looking at this detachment, because um, it just looks fun as hell, you get close to your opponent, you shoot them, they get to hit you, you shoot them again, like, it's just a whole, it's a whole deal. Um, this seems like so much fun to me, personally. Mm -hmm. I think this is a very strong detachment, and the stratagem names are very cool because a lot of them are linked to uh, Commander Farsight's The Eight. So, let's go ahead and talk about the detachment rule, which is Bonded Heroes. It uh, only affects Tau Battlesuit models uh, from your army that make ranged attacks. If they do it within 12 inches, you get plus one strength to your weapons. Is There's a lot of breakpoints in here. Like burst cannons going from strength five to strength six is very nice. Uh, you have your uh, missile pods going from strength seven to strength eight. Riptides are strength eight, right? Big, a lot of big guns. There's a lot of the like ion raker as well on the ghost kill strength eight. They're going to go to strength nine. That's Fusion goes from strength nine point. to strength ten. Big breakpoint. Oh so, my god, you can see it in the firestorm. Firestorm is just spamming out multi meltas and melta guns. And uh, fusion going from strength nine to strength ten is huge. It's a big deal. And so, uh, in addition, if you're within six, you also get plus one AP. That's another big buff. Like Montcar getting lethal hits and assault is cute. It's not bad. It's good. Plus one strength, plus one AP to your ranged weapons is your opponent ceases living. That's you just get close and you just nuke them. And this is what like aggressive armies try and play into Tau, and all of a sudden you're like, oh, you wanted to get aggressive. I'm gonna be plus one strength, plus one AP on all of this. Yep, every gun that's shooting you right now is right up next to you, which is usually how I like to shoot people with Tau. <laughs> it's like, you could be confused for thinking I was in melee range with people. <laughs> I was not. And then you just That's shoot. the Tau way, though. That's the Tau way. You get right up on top of them, and then this blows them to pieces. It's, it is very strong. So, and that this one is the one that acts the whole game. It's no battle round, no particular battle rounds. Games Workshop, I'm sick of your battle round, your battle round restrictions. I have a rule for the whole game. Incredible. Also, this works in combat. So <laughs> if your vehicles are in Where? combat. Oh, uh, in terms of if you're doing range attacks. Yeah, you're yeah, just yeah, in yeah. combat. You, you shoot, shoot into combat. Yeah. <laughs> you're just like, ba 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 I was like, if it worked on melee attacks, far sight. Oh, my God. Yeah. But Only no, like, attacks. your opponent charges you, you live, you shoot into combat. You're still plus one strength, plus one AP. It's yeah. pretty nasty. The overwatch on it, too. Yeah. <laughs> Ooh, are you sure you want to get, you sure you want to make a six inch charge there, Chief? <laughs> yeah, uh, it is model by model. So the model has to be mm -hmm. within six inches or within 12, yep. as most of these type of rules are. But, whew. Now, Farsight still has that if you're within nine plus one to wound as well. So, like, his unit can be 
plus one strength, plus one to wounds, plus one AP. Ignoring, AP ignoring five, cover. AP five fusion guns that wound on twos. <laughs> Good. That's pretty scary. All right. So the enhancements, don't worry. There's a lot of good stuff. Both the enhancements section and the stratagems offer a lot here. Uh, Pure Tide Engram Neurochip. This one is once per turn if the target, if you can, uh, when you target the bearer's unit with a strat, you can use the strat even if you uh, used it somewhere else. Yep. So you target one unit with one strat and the second unit with, and this unit with the Pure Tide Engram Neurochip with the same strat. Now, now it has to be a battle tactic. Yep. Because of the data slate. And if you look here, there's only one of them and it is fairly niche. So the Pure Tide Engram Neuro Trip essentially reads, you can CP reroll, you can Ericon Protocol, which we'll talk about, or I forget the last one. It's like some nonsense. There is nothing else. No, no. In the in the main rulebook, there's a second battle tactic. Oh, is like, it like go to ground or something? It's like, it might be go to ground. I think it's go to ground, which you're not going to do. <laughs> yeah. So it did get moved. I frankly wish it got moved to Moncob because it would be extremely potent there, using a lot of those one CP battle tactics twice, like aggressive mobility. But it did not, and I don't think it's going to get much use here. Yep, I do think that a lot of this book was written before the battle tactic change. I think it this, was probably written at the beginning of the edition. This makes very little sense with the detachment. <laughs> yep. <laughs> but that's okay, you have other enhancements. What are they, see? They are good. So, Star Flare Ignition System. Tau Battlesuit Model, end of the opponent's turn. If the bearer's unit's not within engage range, you can remove it from the battlefield and put it into strategic reserves. Thanks to the rules commentary, that means if you have Deep Strike, you can use Deep Strike instead. That, that's really, that's really good. That's really good, see? That is really good. Yeah, and it's going to be very good because there's another strat here that is extremely strong combined with it. Uh, Torch Star Gambit? Uh, that and also the Shortened Blade. Yes. Well, I mean, yeah, you can come down three away, but I'm mostly thinking, like, you drop in, you shoot, you hop behind a wall, and your opponent's yep. like... Okay, well, I'm going to avoid that unit. And you're like, ah, it's in reserves, and it's coming down over here, and then it shoots you, and then it fire and fades over this way. This is the type of threat that Tau has been looking for, is something in the late game to force your opponent to have to screen the whole game and pull things away from the center. This is not once a game either. This is nope. every turn. Every turn. But it's just be, by being alive with this unit, you are forcing them to have to think about it every single turn. All right. How much is this? Because this, this enhancement is legitimately I think incredible. It's, it's 20 or 25 points. Uh, Starflare Initiative is 20. That's 20. automatically just being baked into your list, period. I don't want to hear anything else about it. That's incredible. Eternal Grenade Racks. Let's talk about Jank. <laughs> this is the most expensive enhancement. It's 30 points. But it goes on a Tau Empire Battlesuit model. The bear gains grenades. So now you can Titan. use the grenade strat on it. And each time the bearer ends a normal move, you can select one enemy unit and moved over during that move. If you do, roll 6d6 on a 4-up, they take mortals. So you can fly over them, do on average 3 mortals, and then throw a grenade and do another 3 mortals. And then Jack, why don't you go look at the Torch Star Gambit and read what type of move that is? Oh, uh, that sounds like a normal move. <laughs> Uh, yep, so that's a second activation. <laughs> when you of fire and fade ability. back over, <laughs> it's a normal move. And so you can do it again. And so, on average, you're going to do around nine mortals plus all the damage of the actual commander. I mean, I think 30 points is steep. If there's anything under that, I think we would just say this is in your list, don't question it. And you have to use your fire and fade on it to get the second part. And you have to use your fire and fade, and you can't advance. Right? It's, it's a normal move. So you can't use if you're using if you put this on a cold star, you're not using what makes a cold star good, right? Yeah. Even so, random access to good mortals, a ton of mortals, a ton right? of mortals. If you want to put the resources into it, is legitimately very good. You run up on a Catan that it has to get close to you, like. But you run up on a Catan, drop three on him, throw a grenade, drop three on him, and then shoot him. And then if he's still alive, and drop three more on him. That's on average going to half health them. Yep. And then you just need to shoot him to death. Just a breacher squad um, should finish most of that off. So this might not be an auto take, but it is very strong. And there are some combos here. You probably do put it on the cold star for that 12 inch move. And because uh, he has the most flexibility of flying over things. It is stronger than it looks. 30 points makes it a bit of a, it's steep, bit of a decision. But I, I think it is genuinely good. Um, and then, and some some armies have very little more wound defense and just suffer against it. All right, prototype weapon system. Yep. Only fifteen points. Pretty cheap. Every time the bearer is selected to shoot, it gets either lethal or sustained one. Usually sustained one. Usually sustained. Sustained is almost always better than lethal, but it is quite solid. Um, but yeah, so that seems pretty good. 
Yep. So uh, I think those, once again, there's one that's probably not really going to ever be taken, and then three that are very competitive, in yep. my opinion. Yep, I would say so. The stratagems. Failsafe Detonator. Strong. They are very strong. So this one is 2 CP. When a Tau Empire battle suit, they pretty much all interact with uh, Tau Empire battle suit only. Yep. So when a battle suit dies, um, you can choose for the die to be on Deadly Demise a 1 or a 6. And if they don't have Deadly Demise on a 4-up, everything within 6 takes mortals. Uh, it's D3. a little different. It is you roll a die for every unit within 6 on a 4-up, that unit takes D3. Yeah, D3. Yeah, so it, it isn't you roll one die and on a 4-up everything takes D3. Yeah, for it's each you unit. roll for each unit 4-up. All right, they yeah. take D3. All right, oh, I missed it. They don't take it. And yeah. you go around. So it's, it's 2 CP, so it's very pricey. Um, there might be times where something's at like one wound that you really wanted to finish off. And you pop this, but I think more than likely, almost all the other strats are better. I really think this could have been one CP. I'm not really sure why it's two. I think just I think it's honestly it's because that they said you can choose to not explode. Like you'd ever spend two CP to do that. Yeah, I have no idea. Um, I think one CP for this would have been totally fine. Yep. So that one that one's a miss, but the all the other ones are quite good. So I don't even know if you would use it that much at one CP. You still wouldn't. It would so, still be situational. All right. You you basically, unless you have, need to do one mortal wound to win the game, uh, <laughs> you which sometimes happens, uh, you have five strats. Failsafe detonator. Mm. Yeah, if you're the type of person to leave your opponent, like let's say they have like five units on an objective, and you wound them all down to one wound, now we're talking value. Now it's value <laughs> town. Let's say you leave the Void Dragon alive at one wound. <laughs> Then I would pop this. <laughs> then I would pop this if I happen to die near him. <laughs> <laughs> then you have uh, Stim Injectors, 1 CP. This one is the 6 of Funeral Pain on a battle suit unit. Wait, hold on one second. Why couldn't they just have made this after you roll the die? It's 2 CP. <laughs> you still on Failsafe Detonator. Yeah. Yeah. I, uh, it's 2 CP. Why is it? Why? I, it's poorly designed. Yeah, That's just okay, fair straight enough. up. <laughs> fair enough. All right, Stim Injectors. We're talking a good strat now. Yep, you use this on uh, in the old old Kalyan detachment. Just six of Fino Pain on a battle suit. Like your Reptile's trying to stay alive. Six of Fino Pain. Crisis unit you want to stay alive. Six of Fino Pain. Yep. And the strength here is that six wound models have very strict breakpoints on five, damage into them. Five wound models now. Sad. We'll get to that. Okay, so this stratagem does get a lot worse now. So the reason it was really good in the past is a six wound model. Not, not a thing anymore. Sad. Uh, but a six wound model had very strict breakpoints, where it was three damage two or two damage three, picked them up. And so you would have very efficient, like, oh, you failed six saves into damage two, two are dead. Done. Done. But if you can pass a six up feel no pain in there, you now require a full extra wound to kill a guy. So it's almost like a five up feel no pain, if you think about it, yeah. because... Just by blanking one of the ticks of damage, you're now requiring a whole extra activation, or whole, not activation, a whole extra failed save to kill the guy. Yeah. And against the damage three, if you take like six saves and you fail four of them, that would just be two guys dead. But now it's very likely one guy dead because... Yeah. And you, we saw this play out yeah. multiple times. Because you would pass a six of feeling no pain, take a whole extra hit, then the next guy would take like two. Yep. Yeah. It was, it was really good. It's so, less good on five wound models to a significant degree, I would actually say. Yeah, it depends on the weapon profiles, but yeah, it's not quite as good. And also, it's not being used on a six-man plus commander. True. Um, um, but like, where it got tremendous value. But Riptide is still pretty solid on the yeah, Riptide. It's, it's good on a Riptide, no question. Um, but like Go on scheme. a five wound model, now if you take three damage two, you're still on average dying. Now you might, you might roll good and just scan them on it and be like, oh, look, you take an extra one to kill me. But... But whereas before it was average, that would happen. Now it's not. Now you need to roll two sixes, not just one. So, so yeah. Mr. Jack, next up we have the Shortened Blade. It's 2 CP, used in your movement phase with a Tau Empire battle suit unit coming in from Deep Strike. Can appear 3.1 away. It's pretty good for a yep. shooting army. That can't, gets... can't charge, obviously, like the other ones. But sure. It's a 2 CP version, so it is more pricey than some of the other variants of it. But just threatening it is extremely powerful. And you, because you can go back into reserves with Starflare Ignition System, you can basically, in the late game, still threaten to do this. Yeah, you can drop to pick something up in kind of an extended portion of the board. Like, your opponent has a unit out on the side. You drop in, blow it up, because you have plus one strength, plus one AP against it. 
your opponent isn't in a position to retaliate, you've cleared that section of the board, right? You've cleared that little po uh, threatening pocket, and Starflare, you just pick it up again. Yep. I, Starflare, I think, is wild. And, and once again, it's the rules commentary that allows units that have Deep Strike that are in strategic reserves to use Deep Strike instead, which then allows you to access this. Yes. So, Shortened Blade is really good. It, it and Torch Star Gambit have weird point, weird CP costs. This entire attachment has weird CP costs, actually. Um, Torch Star Gambit's Fire and Fade, basically. That should be 2 CP. It's and then the show up 3 inches away should be 1. They're just flipped. Why? They, there's a bunch of detachments yeah. like this. I, I don't know. I think they were rolling Yahtzee or something. To, yeah, the to dart just hit a different part of yep. the dartboard. <laughs> but uh, moving on, we got the Arakan Protocol. This is the battle tactic. It's used in your shooting phase. It's very similar to a Votan strat, where you pick a battle suit unit. Until the end of the phase, each time a model in that unit targets an enemy with 6 plus models, if they get sustained 1. If they have 11 plus, you get sustained 2. That's so pretty decent. When Necron Warriors were all over the place, the big bricks, uh, this the Votan strat was amazing against them. There are a handful of armies that do put out some big units. Hypercrypt still uses those warrior units. You've got Endless Swarm that uses big units, and you can just kind of blow them up. Even against six mans, like Custodes come in six mans. Yep, sustain one is not bad. Things things like that. One CP, especially since the battle tactic. So uh, Farsight is going to be. You know, it's going to be pressing that button every single turn <laughs> that you can. Uh, it's it's still pretty good there. Yep. And then uh, the Torch Star Gambit, we've mentioned it before. It's 1 CP, Tell Empire Battle Suit Unit that can fly. Makes a normal move after it shoots. Um, and I believe it is, yeah, so... It is it at any point during the phase you can do it as well. Because at yep. any point after the unit has shot. Because you just select a unit that has shot that turn. Yep. So and you then can you use it them. after you've resolved a bunch of other things. Uh, and the other thing is it still has the qualifier where you have to resolve attacks, unlike the Aldari Fire and Fade. But it is 1 CP, which does make it the best Fire and Fade in the game. It is every turn, baby. <laughs> yeah, no, this... Every turn at 1 CP, and uh, once again, it's not a battle tactic, so you can't increase the cost of it. So just to put 5 CP in for my Torch Star Gambits. Yep. You're, uh, I'm you're gambiting every this. turn, and not in the bad way. Not in the bad way, no. <laughs> You're going to be using this every single turn. It is a wild stratagem. I think Fire and Fade, as a broad camp of strats, made top five, top it made, three. It made top three. Made top three strats in the game in our in our tier list. Uh, and this is the best of those because it's one CP. Every other one is two. This is one. Yeah. It's awesome. Yeah, it's great. Also, the timing on it's amazing. You can just wait at any point during the phase and move. Yep. It's mm. really good. You don't have to call it ahead of time. You don't have to... You can wait and see exactly how many models are left on that objective before you move on. It used to be to start of shooting. You had to do it first, and that's, that was had some real yeah. downsides. Um, but but uh, no, it's, it's fantastic. insane. Then we have the last one. Grab also, by yep. the way, it combos with Star Flare Ignition System beautifully. Because mm -hmm. you, you deep strike, you shoot, then you scoot, behind, you scoot to safety, and then you just pick them up again and repeat the whole process every turn until your opponent, uh, you know, calls it, their mom full, and asks a, you to stop. It's a full normal move. So on that cold star unit, you just boom, twelve inches yeah. back. Yeah, you have to phone up your mom, and, and she'll call their mom and say your son is bullying me. <laughs> like, <laughs> and he's not stopping. He's not going to stop. He's not stopping. You have to do something. Uh, last stratagem is grab inhibitor fields. I think this one's a pretty big miss. Uh, your opponent's charge phase uh, just after they declare to charge. You pick a Tau Empire battle suit unit that they're charging, and um, that unit takes a battle shock test. The enemy unit. And then uh, you roll a d6 for each model in that enemy unit. On a 6, they take a mortal. This could have been a 5, and it would still been okay. Or if it had the minus 2 to charge, like photon grenades. Or something. And this strat used to have that in uh, ninth edition. So, I did. once again, there could be some like miracle time where you would really want to force the battle shock, but probably not. Probably not. I mean, it is nice if they're charging to get onto an objective. You can be like, battle shock, sir. There aren't too many shenanigans from like minuses to that to make it really consistent, but yeah. You know. um, so the stratagems are kind of mediocre. In fact, I would actually call four of them like not great. There's two that are all right: the stim injectors and the sustained hits. One is all right. Grav inhibitor and failsafe detonator are actively bad, but torch star gambit and shortened <laughs> blade are wild. <laughs> so, <laughs> worth it. <laughs> so you get you know up to three CP a battle round, and there are. 
two stress that total up to three CP. Put the two of those together. <laughs> Figure that out. You've got plenty to do with that. Yes. Uh, so I, I'm very happy with that. I think those two strats alone, plus the enhancements and the detachment rule itself being awesome, that's enough to say that I, I really love this detachment. One CP fire and fade. It is also possible that the grenades one is better just because you don't have that many strats you're going to be using anyway. Like, yeah. Just throw grenades in there. Grenades is a really good strat. Yeah, and then you can use the fire and fade on him, and all of a sudden there's a lot of mortals every turn. Oh yeah, but you can't deal with it. Yeah, you have like fire and fade modes, which is the star flare. You drop in, you shoot, you scoot, you hop up, you drop <laughs> in, scoot and shoot, or like your opponent starts coming in your face, and you have like, you know, the grenades mode where you run over your opponent, grenades them, and then run over them again <laughs> on the way out. Yeah, and you're gonna get close to them anyway, so you're getting the plus one strength, plus one AP, and um, you can put your commander, this guy in a squad of crisis suits to make him have Ablet of Wounds, and he can just survive the whole game and be annoying. All right. We have one last attachment. It's the crew mm -hmm. hunting pack. So I do think that the Retaliation Cadre and Mont Car are both mint. Yep. I, I think they are both the two strongest attachments. I think Cao Yun already had some severe limitations that Tao was able to play around be through very good players exercising you know, a mission style. And I still think you could play that with Cao Yun. It just doesn't reward it as well as the other two detachments, which I Absolutely. think really reward. If your opponent gets close to you, your damage goes up, and you're, you know, in Monka, your just tools are fantastic for getting around the board. Yeah, Monka has a worse detachment rule, but better strats. And Retaliation Cadre has a really good detachment rule and some really good strats, just not as deep of a bench. Yep. Um, both of them have good enhancements. I think both of them are great. I think Breacher Spam is really rewarded in Monka, whereas in Retaliation Cadre, like triple Riptide, maybe you know one to three Ghost Keels, bunch of Stealth Suits, Commanders with Crisis Suits, like you're really emphasizing the Battle Suit aspect of it. Absolutely. Well, let's talk about something that isn't emphasizing the Battle Suit aspect of anything. Nope. It's emphasizing the Crude aspect of everything. <laughs> uh, so, do you want to read the Crude? Absolutely. Okay. <laughs> All right, you knew I did. Okay, so you have two different detachment rules. One is that Crute get a 6-up invuln against melee and a 5-up invuln against range attacks, which is very helpful. They are fragile as paper, and yep. having an invuln is better than not having an invuln. And most of them have stealth. So now you're stealth, you got a 5-up invuln. That's not bad. It's like sneaky durability. It's not like actual durability. If your opponent really brings the guns to bear, you're going to die. But like it means that they don't just casually brush your units aside, which is yep. nice. Um, and the other one is Hunter's Instincts. Every time a recruit model from your army makes an attack, plus one to hit if the target is below starting strength, plus one to wound if the target is below half strength. That is not amazing. Um, the below starting below half triggers are not great. They're not great. Uh, usually the most impactful activations are going to be a full strength unit into a full strength unit. Yeah, if a this lot said, of the time. If they were at full strength, you get plus one to hit. And then if they were below its starting strength, you get plus one to wound, it would be significantly better. I listen, on the literally on the drive here, I was I was pondering Alea. And Alea gives her unit plus one to a hit if they're below starting and plus one to wound if they're below half. And I was thinking, man, it'd be great if this was just plus one to hit, and if they're below half below starting, plus one to wound. Because a lot of times units don't get to sit in that range. Now this gets to key off of your opponent, so you can throw a grenade first. And then shoot them. You can you can make that happen, right? You can get plus one to hit fairly easily. You just need to chip a wound off of a multi wound model or kill a model in a multi model unit, and you'll get plus one to hit. Plus one to wound, not as impactful. This, uh, yeah. If they were below starting strength, plus one to wound would be interesting for crew. Crew don't like hit that hard. Yeah. Um. But yeah, it would be better if this was at the very least like. Uh, eight bound, where they're just always a reroll ones aura, and then if the target is below half, then there are reroll wounds. That below half reroll wounds thing never comes up, ever, because you don't really need help killing things that are already mostly dead. Yeah, and and when we look at the crew profiles, they do need help killing anything that has any amount of durability. So this needed to be to like run a pure crew army. This needed to be like a real killer damage buff. It needed, I, I think I think you're right, it needed to be plus one to hit and just flat and plus one to wound if your opponent was below starting. Or you could just have it be plus one to hit and wound if your target's below starting. Yeah. If you wanted to have some kind of condition that it wasn't just your whole army gets plus one to hit. But like, 
There needed to be something. It needed to be like pretty easy to access. The plus one to wound is the vital part. Fruit tend to have low strength. I don't know if that changed with their units. They're still not like amazing at yeah. killing tanks. And they needed to have plus one to wound to even that out a decent amount of the time. And it's just so, you need to have already mostly killed the unit in order to be able to kill units. That does not make a lot of sense. <laughs> if you could get them to blow half strength, you can probably finish them off. Yeah. <laughs> So, and this appears in other parts of the game. It's just one of those aspects of 10th edition where the design philosophy was reduced damage, and then half of the team who designed the original part of the game just ignored that. And so some units are just too, just do too much damage or have too much durability because they're designed to survive against that amount of damage. If the game was in admic level of damage, this is actually quite a good rule because a lot of stuff is just going to be wounded out throughout the game. Yeah, yeah. Um... Yeah, I, I, I don't think it's amazing. I think the plus one to hit if they're below starting strength is pretty reasonable to trigger, right? You fire some guns, you throw a grenade, whatever. Um, that feels pretty reasonable. The plus one to wound is the part they need, and that's locked behind doing most of the work without it. Yes. I don't love that. Yeah. And then finally, you get a battle line on your crude carnivores, which are basically the, the basic crude infantry troop. All right, the crude hawk flock. <laughs> Crute, all of these are crute only. Uh, some of them are trail shaper. Oh, one of them is a trail shaper. One's a war shaper. One's a flesh shaper. I don't know what any of those do. We'll find out later. The new shaper versions. Yeah. So one is just crute. It's a crute hawk flock. Ranged weapons uh, equipped by models in the bear's unit have ignores cover, and enemies cannot be set up as reinforcements within 12. How many points is this? I don't care. It's, it's taken. If you're I mean, running yes, this it's just in there. It's 10 points. <laughs> yeah, like, <laughs> incredible. You take it. <laughs> yeah, uh, 12-inch no-deep strike is incredibly powerful right now. Um, Vanguard Marines are one of, <laughs> if not the strongest army in the game. Um, just, even the, the Gladius, which is my pick for strongest army in the game, uses Inceptors relentlessly. And then um, Necrons also use 3-inch deep strikes or even 9-inch deep strikes. Uh, really, really, really well. Yeah, and, and if, then there's other armies that deep strike on you, and if, just having 12 inch blocking that is huge. If you're playing into the mirror matchup where they're playing the Codger <laughs> retaliation Codger, <laughs> stop deep striking. <laughs> yes, I'm talking to you. Uh, so that's really good. It's 10 points. It's in your list. Just include it on somebody. Blocking deep strikes is really good. The fact you get ignores cover, I suppose, is a rule that exists. Yeah. Um, Nomadic Hunter is a trail shaper. While the model is leading a unit, add three to the move characteristic models in that unit, and ranged weapons get assault. That is really good. Nomadic Hunter is 20 points, um, but plus three move is just a hell of an enhancement, and yep. uh, you're doing Assault it. as well, you can and advance assault. and do actions. You're gonna do it. I, I believe, is this the detachment that gives like insane buffs to terrible units? Yes. Yes, cool, cool, cool. <laughs> I love that design space. That's super fun. <laughs> like the strats are pretty good too. Yeah, and that, that enhancement's buck wild. Uh, root carved weapons is a war shaper. All weapons equipped by the bear of precision and dev wounds. This is ten points, so it is dirt cheap. And he hits decently hard. He's the hardest hitting out of all the shapers models. Okay, I mean when we get to we'll, him, yeah, we'll get to him. When we'll, we get to him, we'll we'll cover whether or not you want it. He's still not like a space marine captain or anything like that. Yeah, no, but you know, being able to snipe out maybe a techno technomancer would be nice. Mm -hmm. And uh, getting precision is like it saves you a CP. Dev wounds is he anti anything? I don't believe so. I would, I'd be surprised. But uh, you know, you never know. Let's see. War shaper is, is this all of his weapons? All weapons get precision and dev wounds. Yep. Which does include the anti infantry three plus dart blow and tri blade. <laughs> dart, dart bow and tri blade. <laughs> so at that point, it's D three plus one shots. With precision, dev wounds, anti infantry, three plus damage two. Yeah, it's not bad. For ten points, I'm doing that. Yeah. And that's <laughs> his gun, and in combat, he is lethal hits. But, uh, and all of his guns getting precision, I like that. I, I would, I'd pay ten points for that. That's fine, yeah. Yeah. Borthrod gland, while the bear is leading a unit, each time a model in that unit makes a melee attack, hit roll five plus scores a crit. And that is 15 points, and wow, that's a good, that's a, wow, that is a good ability. <laughs> and then you look at the weapons. <laughs> but they need that. Yeah, they, they need it. They need it to be good. They need to, like, every rule here can't be a stinker like it was in ninth, uh, ninth Edition Codex. All the crude stuff was basically terrible. Yeah. Uh, all, of these, all of these enhancements 
are ones I would consider to be auto includes. So one checked. of them gets left at home, and yeah. that is just how it goes. Um, yeah, if you're including War Shaper, I think Root Carved Weapons is just, just you just put it on him, because that way he can at least do things, um, which I think is interesting. The rest of them, Borthrog Land is insanity, uh, and it's on Kroot, so let's not get too excited, but like, damn! Uh, Kroot Hawk Flock, saying you can't set up within 12 is insane, Nomadic Hunter plus 3 move and Assault is insane, they're all wild. All right. Let's look at these strats here. Join the hunt. 2 CP. Any phase, a Kroot Infantry or Kroot Hounds unit from your army that was just destroyed uh, comes back to life. Cannot bring characters back to attached units, but if you've seen uh, Guard at all, you know that bringing their units back to life is really good. So I do think 2 CP, join the hunt, is really solid. Yeah, I mean, it's going to bring back some random Kroot unit, but uh, can't bring back any of the bigger guys. No, just infantry crew hounds, but it could be a 20-man crew infantry unit. It really will be. <laughs> yeah, it really will be. So, I mean, I think it's pretty good. It is a battle tactic, but I don't think we have any way to do it for free. Um, uh, I don't believe so in this detachment. I don't, I don't think so. But, yeah, join the hunt, pretty good. Getting units for free in strat reserves is just a good thing in 40k right now. I like it. Trap well laid, 1 CP, shooting or fight phase, a crew unit that has not shot or fought. Uh, after your unit has resolved its attack, select one enemy unit that was hit. Until the end of the phase, every time a crew model from your army makes an attack that targets that enemy unit, unless they are battle shocked, improve the AP by one. That's pretty good. Yep. One crew unit taps something, and then everyone else gets plus one AP and dog piles it. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> or crew piles it. Uh, I think that's pretty good. Legitimately, plus one AP is really, really good on these weapons. Yep. EMP grenades. Uh, crew grenade unit within eight inches of a vehicle. Um, so in your opponent's shooting or fight phase, just after an enemy vehicle unit is selected to shoot or fight, you throw a grenade at it, and it gets minus one weapon skill or ballistic skill. And if you have stealth, that combos, because it reduces their weapon skill or ballistic skill. Yep. So if you reduce their ballistic skill by one, and then you have stealth, they're minus two to hit, so they go from hitting on threes to hitting on fives. Yep. And it's because uh, minuses to hit alone are capped at minus one, but this is a ballistic skill modifier first, then the minus one to hit applies in yep. the roll. And I like that. If yeah. they walk up to a crew unit to kill it, you're just like, minus two to hit. <laughs> it's pretty strong. If Space Marines start hitting on fives, they full, don't like full that. Full rerolls, baby. I mean, against their oath target, sure, but against yeah. anything else, they like motor up to an objective to blast <laughs> a squad of crew into the sky, and you're like, nope. Unfortunately, you can only use it on vehicles, so, you know, but there are some good vehicles out there. Yeah. Um, any vehicles that like getting in combat also really hate that. Um, so it's interesting. I don't think you'll use it all the time, but occasionally you're just going to tell a Vindicator it hits on fives, and they don't like that. They don't like that at all. Grizzly Feast. Fight phase, a crew unit from your army that destroyed one or more enemy units. In your opponent's next command phase, every enemy unit within six inches has to take a battle shock test. If they're below half strength, they're minus one. And enemy, yeah, okay. So this is the same strat as the World Leader stratagem that causes me to joke that World Leaders have five stratagems. <laughs> <laughs> it's dead useless. I've never even thought about using that strategy in World Leaders, and I've played them a lot. And um, it's very bad. It's just very good. Very not, very not good. Especially since it, you have to kill your opponent in combat with Kroot, which is not easy. Not the easiest thing. Not like, not like something you won't be doing, but it's not something you can just do for free. Uh, like World Leaders, where if you, you know, brush up against somebody, they combust. Uh, even there, you're just not, you're just not using it. It's so bad in World Leaders. It's so bad, dude. The range is just too narrow. It's too narrow. It has a decent chance of not doing anything. A lot of the time, you don't care if you battle shock like three or four units. You're really looking at one. And then there's like a decent amount of the time that they're not going to take, that they're like, that they're just going to pass the battle shock. Uh, if they have two units on an objective, it's completely pointless because they're going to pass it most of the time. Like the vast majority of the time, they're going to pass both. Or past one of the two. And you also have to be close to an objective, but not on the objective. And it only triggers on your opponent's next turn, so it can't you can't like force a battle shock check, turn off a defensive ability and hit them. It's not ideal. <laughs> it's it's not great. Um, Gorilla Warriors, on the other hand, is a crew unit can fall back and shoot and charge for one CP. It's a great strat. Great strat. No uh, no qualifiers there. Hidden Hunters, 1 CP, your opponent's shooting phase just after an enemy unit has selected its targets. 
One recruit unit from your army that was selected as the target of one or more of the attacking unit's attacks. It's attack a lot. Until the end of the phase, your unit can only be selected as the target of a ranged attack if that attacking model is within 12. Woo, baby! Love it's that. just any crew unit. Any of the crew units, so it doesn't have to be infantry locked. It does not have to be infantry locked. So that is very good. You're going to use that pretty much every time your opponent... Every their opponent's turn. <laughs> yeah, every every time your opponent has a shooting phase, something in your army is just not getting shot, mm -hmm. um, and then something else is coming back to life, and then you have stealth on everything and invulns. I could see this being legitimately an annoying army to try and chew through in shooting, because when you do get a good beat on it, you know they're making you minus two to hit, or they're bringing their unit back to life, or they're telling you you can't shoot. So I think that's I think that's kind of interesting. Yeah, uh, my biggest thing here is this only buffs crew units, and right now the roster, even though it's expanded, still isn't like amazing. There's a lot of gaps. There's no greater gnar gnarlock or anything that's supposed to kill really durable things, and because of that, I don't think you get enough out of this detachment. Frankly, what I'd like to see is if you took some amount of crew models, like you had to take a shaper plus you know minimum of like three crew units, you just get access to this suite of stuff for your crew units. That, I think, would have been quite cool and interesting. Oh, taking crew in another detachment. If you take a different detachment and you take a minimum of, like, the Shaper plus three crew units, you get access to this suite of strats. That would have been cool. But I think trying to force the whole crew army based on their current roster just isn't going to work right now. Uh, yeah, there's just some holes in the in the army. Now, I, we'll go it'd through be the sick sheets. to play them at an event, for sure. Yeah. Um, but you're going to run into a... Difficulty killing things. I think I was just laughing at your uh, the when you talked about Vanguard Marines like Inceptors coming down. Like, yeah, you'll block that one part of the board, but man, they will just table this army ludicrous light speed, and your damage output just isn't enough to kill things quick. Like, well, you think damage Admech have a damage problem? This detachment has a big damage problem. After they kill a unit, you can bring it back. <laughs> <laughs> Let them kill it again. Let them kill it again, baby. Let's go. And then you take a 20-man, and it's below half strength. Not that that matters. Actually, it has to be the opponent that's below yeah. half strength. But whatever. Let's go. Um, I mean, I think I would... I would totally play this army to, like, an RTT for sure. Um, let's look through the data sheets. Yep. But I would love to play Crude. Crude are sick. Um, I think there's a lot the of people models who look great. Way. New models look great. I want to shape war and shape path and whatever the shapers do. Flesh. I think, um, but uh, yeah, uh, they are going to run into some damage issues, but we'll look at the data sheets when we get there. Yep. So uh, the vast majority of these have remained basically the same. There's a couple small tweaks to a handful of them. There's some removals here, and um, there's also the um, like fundamentally new data sheets. So well, I'll, when something is basically the same, I'll, I'll say that. So Shadow Sun, for instance, is if effectively the same thing. And so if you were familiar with her in the index, uh, she's, she's going to be remaining the exact same and quite a solid unit overall. Farsight went up to, went from six to eight wounds? Yep, he gained two wounds, and I think that's because he doesn't, he isn't allowed to take drones, and so the other commanders, like the Enforcer, can go from six to eight by taking shield drones. And um, I think they just wanted Farsight to have the extra wounds. Um, that makes so sense. That's nice, but his data sheet did change. So Pure Tide's teachings is his new one. He used to be able to do once per battle a full reroll to hit and wound in combat. Now instead, once per battle round, you can target his unit for stratagem for zero CP, even if you've already targeted a different unit with that Which strat. in Montka is really strong. Very strong there. And in the Retaliation Contra, might as well not exist. But that's okay. You not get the sustained or a CP reroll. Like, he'll CP reroll a failed save every turn. And uh, you still get the plus one to wound, and it is still on attacks, not ranged attacks. You can still use it on combat swings. Yeah, his combat is nothing to write home about, but it is the best combat in Tau. And he's a pretty decent tank shock. As well. That's true, because he's a strength 10 vehicle. Yep. Yep. Um, in terms of the characters, so the Crisis Commander is gone. Uh, so there is only an Enforcer and Cold Star Commander. There's not regular. Oh, because all the, I think Crisis Commander is just Enforcer Commander now. Crisis Commander is just deleted. He was his own separate thing. He got he had a data sheet rule for reroll ones. He's gone yeah. completely. And if now, you are a commander, you are in funky armor. That's yeah, how it works. You're an Enforcer or a Cold Star, and that's it. Now, in terms of uh, their weapons, the first thing that you'll notice here is that plasma, 
went down from 24 to 18 inch range. Really? Yes. Ooh, that Which is is not good. That's not good for plasma. I'll plasma was barely competing in my mind with fusion, and now I think fusion is just clearly better. Because um, fusion is also 18, right? No, fusion's 12. Fusion's 12. But okay. fusion has the extra strength in AP and D6 plus two melta. Yeah. Um, which I think is is better, especially if in plasma the detachment where you want to get within 12. Yeah. If plasma isn't twice as far, like twice as long range, the fact that fusion just does more damage yep. is going to add up. Now, the other change that you will notice here is that a cyclic ion gave was granted a star, and the star is this model cannot have duplicates of this piece of war gear. I see. They're really cutting down on cyclics. It used to be you would have, like, at the start of the edition, there were, like, 30 cyclics in every army, and now there's going to be, like, two. Yep. So you're going to take one. <laughs> oh, yeah, for sure. Then you're going to take other weapons. In the in the battle suit detachment, the Retaliation Chondra, I actually quite like uh, the volume that you get from burst cannons that go from strength 5, AP 0, to strength 6, AP 1. Four shots is a... Um... So that would be 12 shots on the Enforcer plus the cyclic which goes to strength 9, AP 3 when overcharged, or the Cold Star Commander, where you have the high output burst cannon at 8 shots, then you can add 2 more burst cannons and a cyclic. That's actually quite a good volume of fire uh, when you throw in access to easy ignores cover. Yeah, because you have the, the high output burst is 8 shots. It goes to 6 one, one, which is not bad. Yep. And you, you do ignore his cover, and yeah, that guy's, that guy's pretty decent. Missile pods are not bad as a cyclic kind of replacement, where it's one less shot, but when you're in Retaliation Contra, you go to Strength 8, potentially AP 2, 2 damage, which is not bad, um, obviously. So uh, there's some interesting things there. Uh, and then Fusion, obviously, uh, gains quite a bit of going to Strength 10, AP 5. Yes. Uh, really helps you punch through those, those vehicles now. Yeah, Strength 10, AP 5 Fusion is terrifying. <laughs> and I could definitely see a commander that can get um, a cyclic and triple Fusion and just going to town. Especially, I mean, if you did take Calion plus one to hit plus one to wound, it's pretty gnarly on him, but you're probably not taking Now, Calion. the commanders kept the ability to take duplicates of their drones, so you can take double shield drone on them. Okay. All right. Uh, Cold Star and the Enforcer, both same, the data, same data sheet rules. The Fireblade, as well, is also going to keep his plus one attacks to the ranged weapons equipped by models in the unit. Uh, Ethereal, he is basically the same as well, can still take his hover drone. Um, Dark Strider also remains the same. What you're going to note here is there's no on she, no on va, removed from the codex. It's just gone. Just completely gone. So what you're telling me is on va's last appearance on stream is dying like a coward to a failed battle shock and then dying on a fallback. Rolling a ton of ones on his two up invuln and then dying on a failed battle shock. Yep, that, yep, that was yep. it. Okay. But he he did Sad. great in the other game. Rip. <laughs> Uh, so, yep, some character removals here. Uh, Dark Strider still does the 12-inch no, no deep yep. strike, which is uh, good to point out. Yep, and then heading on to strike teams, they did change. So they used to have their data sheet rule as a 4-up Overwatch, which you just would never run this unit. Now, instead, in your shooting phase after they've shot, you pick an enemy infantry unit that was hit. Till the start of the next turn, um, while the unit is on the battlefield, that enemy is suppressed, and that means they're minus one to hit, both shooting and combat. So... You could debuff things. It's only infantry again, so are you really getting tremendous amount of value from it? Probably you not. You know, I would rather give my opponent minus infinity to hit by killing them with breachers. Exactly. So luckily the breacher is basically the same exact thing. Still hits on BS3. Kept that. Kept assault on his pulse blaster. So great in all the different detachments. And then you get that reroll wounds against enemies on objectives. Dude, strength 7 AP2 in the retaliation cadre. They're not battle suit. Is Retaliation Contra only battle suit? Yes, battle okay. suit model. All right, well, then in Montcar, giving them plus one AP, giving two units plus exactly. one AP. Yep. Uh, yes, it is battle suit. Okay, thank you for pointing that out. <laughs> yeah. Otherwise, I would have been 60 breaches for sure in that detachment. Well, I mean, all of your all of the detachments you're running are running going to be 60 breaches. You know, breaches. I love that. All right. So, but in Montcar, yes, they do get like the plus one AP, they get lethal hits, they, they love all that stuff. Luckily, breaches didn't change. They're fantastic. Auto take. Then we've got the Crisis Battle Suits. So, big changes here. They are no longer six-mans. You can only take them in three-mans, and the weapons are restricted. Uh, you can only take two weapon slots per model now, and you have a new data sheet rule for each of the three different types, and they usually have a support. Each of them has one of the support systems built in, um, so you can't decide which ones to take. So flexibility is completely gone, besides switching between two different weapon options, effectively. 
So, and you can't take duplicate drones on these guys. So you can't go to six uh, wounds with the shield drone, you can only go to five. Uh, but you are able to put gun drones on there, which is probably going to be the new take. And guess what? Gun drones equip you uh, with an additional weapon. And that weapon is now equipped by a battle suit, so it gets access to the retaliation contra. So gun drones are two attacks, um, strength five, no AP, one damage, twin linked. But in the retaliation contra, because they're equipped to the crisis model, they'll get plus one strength, strength six, AP one, twin linked. Okay. Which with all the extra shots you get, that's actually not bad. All right, so let's look at the first one, which is Sunforge. Pretty suits. sick. Um, yep. It is the anti-tank one. It has two fusion blasters, and this thing, this unit will melt tanks into slag at close range in the retaliation cadre. It's the one that kept the four-up invuln. So it's the only crisis unit that has the four-up invuln, which I already love fusion, so I'm kind of Oh, glad this about seems it. like this is just... Definitely the best. And they got one of the best uh, of the rules, which is Sunforge. Each time a ranged attack is made by a model in the unit, so it means if the commander's in the unit, you also get it on him, because he's a model in the unit. Allocated When the attacks are allocated to a monster or vehicle, you reroll wounds and damage on your fusion. That's pretty good. Now, you only have two fusion each, but still... It's with... not reroll hits wounds and damage like eradicators. Uh, Space Marines have, can teach you a thing or two. Yep. But, but at the same time, there are ways to get rerolls to hit. So it's not the end of the world. And this dramatically helps the consistent, because in the uh, retaliation contract, you go to strength 10. Now there's a lot of vehicles that are in that strength 9 to strength 10 category that you're perfectly fine into. AP5 ignores cover, means that you're denying saves to even two up armor, like land raiders, things like that. Yeah, it's like, just... do you want armor and contempt for a six up? <laughs> like you have um, Farsight with them, right? You run up. You shoot, you hand them a couple saves that they, they can't pass, and then you're just like, all right, yeah. It's a, and you reroll damage as well, so you're just like, bye. <laughs> just, just dead. This is a big upgrade for fusion, in my opinion. And um, one CP, fire and fade on this unit, utterly fantastic. Being able to three-point one away into key vehicles, also fantastic. I, I actually also really like this without uh, Farsight. Yep. For the very simple reason that this is the cl classic case of a character not buffing a unit, but of a unit buffing a character. Mm -hmm. So you put a character in there, an enforcer commander, or a probably... It's probably the Cold Star. So probably the Cold Star, so you can flag. go really fast. Yep. But the Cold Star could have three fusion and a cyclic, and you rock up, and then the Cold Star with those extra guns as well re-rolls their wound rolls. And the Cold Star hits on threes normally, right? Yeah, BS3. Yes. So they also re-roll their wound rolls and their damage rolls when they shoot because it's the whole unit. So that unit slams. It's now, 160. 160 them. is cheaper per model than current. Uh, 200 right? points for three of the current. 200 points for three of the current. This is 160 for three, which is a significant rebate. Now you get fewer guns but you do get a good ability to compensate for that. And then the Cold Star Commander is currently, because I'm not going to go off this for any unit that already has Cold a, Star is 110 in the current ones. 110. So that would be 270 for that unit. That unit blasts things into another dimension. Yep. So I do like that. Yep. And then the Cold Star, because he's a generic character, can take Star Flare Ignition to go, be able to go back into reserve. Do like that. Yep. And then they move 12, right? Yes. So you can exactly. fire and fade Flat 12. 12. You can advance 18. Or you can advance, yes, Eight. 18. Get in, blow something Only, up, move 12. So Crisis Suits used to have the flat six advances their data sheet rule, so that's no longer here. You have oh, to, that you have was to be, their, okay, that's you have to be a Monka, so you have to roll, you'll, you'll move 12 plus D6. Got it, I thought that was all part of the Cold Star, but it is not. No, that used to be the Crisis data sheet rule, so now that that doesn't exist, it's been split up, but I frankly prefer this extra damage boost. Yeah. And in Monka, these are still very good because you can flat six advance them and literally move the 18, get within range and blow them up. Yep. Um, so yeah, I, I think this is, I really like this unit, um, and we'll see what its actual points cost ends up being, because this was obviously written quite a while ago, so if it stays around that points cost, I think it's pretty reasonable. Yeah, I, th I think it's a pretty, just a pretty good unit. Then we have the Crisis Fire Knife Battle Suits. These pick between Plasma or Missile Pods, and once again, it's two each. Their um, weapon support system, they don't get the invuln, they get ignore modifiers to hit. The weapon support system, uh, which is fine. It doesn't ignore ballistic skill modifiers, so it doesn't help with splitting fire. And their other rule, the fire knife rule, is each time the model makes a ranged attack, you reroll ones natively. 
And if that attack targets a unit at its starting strength, which is the good version of the rule, full rerolls to hit. Yes. Now this is 165. It is the most expensive, and I'm not sure why. Um, two plasma rifles or two missile pods are just not the same thing. It's not the same. Now I will say, giving a commander reroll hits is pretty decent. Giving ignore mods is pretty decent. Ignore mods to hit specifically, not to ballistic skill. Not so if you're in combat, you're minus one to hit. You can ignore that. That's cute. I don't see this unit doing as much damage as the Sunforge. It's also more expensive, and it does not have an invuln. So I don't love it. Yeah, I think this one's a big miss. This one needs a big points decrease, frankly, in my mind, to really compete. Yeah, I think this thing needed to be like 135. Because it just doesn't do enough damage to justify a whole observer unit as well. Yeah. It's just, yeah. Um, it, it has a solid rule, but then its defense is poor, and you, you're you using your key resources on this rather than other things. It doesn't really make much sense. All right, so next up we got the Star Scythe, and this one is the cheaper one. This is 140. Yep. Um, even so, it's not like that's not cheap, for the record. It's yeah. just cheaper. Burst Cannon or Flamer is the two weapon options you can pick from. And each time the model in the unit makes a ranged attack, excluding against monsters and vehicles, so the opposite of fusion, you get plus one AP. So it means you can go to AP plus two AP in the Retaliation Codger. Or in Monka. Six, or in Monka with the Stratagem. And um, you also get Fallback and Shoot from their Battle Suit Support System, but no Invuln. I actually don't hate this. I think that the unit needs to be a bit cheaper. I think a little cheaper. Um, 140 is a little too close to the Sunforge, although I suppose if you're taking three Sunforges, then your fourth would... Fire Knife, while it has the coolest name, unfortunately, is not... It's not quite the knife you need. Not, not quite the knife I need. Uh, the Star Scythe is pretty good. Plus one AP to the attached character is really strong. And when you think about those Burst Cannon characters I was coming up with, all of a sudden they actually put out a nasty amount of AP2. Potentially. Yeah, AP2 plus one strength. strength. A lot of strength six. Suddenly AP2. we're looking at eight. I mean, it's a little weird to me that the burst cannon is four shots in this edition. Um, but this unit would pop off with 24 at potentially 621. That's not a bad amount of firepower. It's not. Legitimately, bad. It's, it's not a bad amount of firepower. Um, you do have to get within six to do that yep. or be in uh, Montcon and have spent a CP. But. It's not bad. And then you have an attached character who can get like their cyclic to strength 9 AP 4 damage too, which is a very different profile to 822. Uh, and whatever random guns they have will also get increased. It seems okay. I, I really do think the Tau Flamer needed to be D6 plus 2 and the Burst Cannon needed to be 6 like it was in the previous editions. Yeah, I, I think that once again, and you look at the Missile Pod, you look at the Plasma, Plasma going down in range really hurts it a lot. I was really hoping that the Codex would change a lot of the weapons to make them more competitive with each other, and they put zero effort into doing that. They, I mean, they put a little effort into it because yeah. they made they made, fusion they made cyclic not competitive with yeah. anything by literally <laughs> removing it from data sheets. Um, but yeah, so looking at this, the flamers are okay, but D6 a piece for two weapons is not where I want to be. Because, like, what I would love to do is have a flamer unit. Like, I think D6 plus 2 or 6 shots on the burst was where they needed to be. Yep. If they had a double flamer unit that was 2D6 plus 4 on each guy, and then they got plus 1 strength, plus 1 AP, you get up to 5, 2, 1 if they're within 6 inches. And considering you have 0 melee punch at all, getting up close to your opponent with flamers definitely is a risky maneuver. So For like such an expensive unit, because you throw a character in here, this is not a cheap it's unit. 250, though. yeah. Um... I I think this unit either needs to become a, a decent amount cheaper, like 25 points cheaper or something like that. Yeah. Or, it. I mean, they're not going to change the profile, so. They could, they could, because in the last data slate, they did change. Now, they might have to wait for a data slate to this do This might that. be like a six-month thing, but, but you know. But they were showed a willingness with Grey Knights, who really did need it as well. And I, I do think that these profiles just don't really make any sense for competing uh, with some of the other weapons, unfortunately. Yeah, I think that, again, can't bang this drum enough. I think the Burst Can just need to be six shots, and I think the Tau Flamer need to stay D6 plus two from last edition. Those were not the weapons that were given, that were causing people problems. And having Flamers would be very interesting design space for Tau. Yeah. I think removing Cyclic is, from being just the spammed weapon is fine, as long as you replace it with other options. But I think they didn't do the best job at replacing it. Now, that being said... Fusion I still awesome. think Star Scythe is fine. You attach a character to them. They have a lot of AP2 coming at you. Mm -hmm. I think they're fine. Yep. 
Sunforge, I think, I think that, that decrease in yeah. there, and this unit is just okay. Yep. Which is good. And they, they do get to fall back and shoot. So even if they do get close to your opponent, they can fall back and shoot them and then overwatch them. Like, I think it's pretty decent. Especially with the, like the Flamers might be the way, right? Because you get seven shots on average as opposed to eight off the burst cannon. Mm -hmm. And then you get to shoot and overwatch and shoot and overwatch and shoot and overwatch. Um, I think it could be the way. I don't know. I think it's an interesting unit. Yep. I, I think it's fine. I don't think it's bad. At 140, I think it's all right. I just don't think it compares very well to the Sunforge. I think the Sunforge is legitimately very good. The 4-up invuln was a big deal to keep Crisis Suits alive and dedicate firepower to them. And them keeping it with what, in my opinion, is the best of the data sheet rules of these three, because Tau want help punching into vehicle spam lists. I think this this one's the best of the units. Yeah, I think the Sunforge is, is the one you take, and then once you run out of that, you might take Star Scythe. There are combos there. It has one of the better buffs for um, the character attached to it, because plus one AP is pretty ridiculous. Yeah. Um, so I, I think there's options there, for sure. Yep. Stealth Sue's got a huge buff. They used to be only reroll ones to wound for their... Uh, Observer benefit. Now it's reroll ones to hit, ones to wound, which genuinely makes them competitive with the Tetras now. And they don't give up bring it down points. So I think they got a huge boost, and I, I plan to spam stealth suits again. Yes, they are uh, infantry, so they can run through walls. They have burst cannons of their very, very own. And then that homing beacon is one of their best things, is a zero CP rapid ingress. And uh, being able to do that so that you can uh, like 3.1 away, spend your CP on that instead, or save it for fire and fade, it's yeah. very good. Yeah, so you can't 3.1 away with this. What you're saying is, yeah, yeah. what you're saying is you save the CP so that in your turn. Exactly, I don't have to spend as much CP on my opponent's turn, so I have it in the bank for mine. Yes, I, I like the, I like self battle suits a lot, actually. What are they currently at? They're 60? 60 points. I think that is of a very, very good Yep. Unit. You get one fusion on the Chazui, you've got a couple burst cannons in their battle suits, so they can go up and get the extra benefits from the retaliation cadre, but I think they go in every detachment. Yeah. No, I think they're I think they're incredible. They don't do a ton of damage. They I remember when uh, the Tau book came out uh, in ninth edition, they did ridiculous damage from stealth suits if you like comboed all the buffs. Yeah. Uh, now that's not the case. But even so, six one one in the retaliation cadre yep. is they're, they're legitimately totally a good profile. Yep. And then you have the fusion that threatens people. Yeah, I mean, like, Stealth Suit's really good. Ghost Keel, he is still his old annoying self. He just happens to really like the Retaliation Cadre. A lot. Yep. Uh, being able to go to Strength 9 AP3 on his Cyclic Iron Raker is awesome. And his fusion then goes to Strength 10, potentially AP5. To his Fusion Collider is Strength 12 base. I'm talking about the Iron Raker. I see. No, the, the Iron Raker, I think, is definitely the one you pick. Yeah. Because nine three three is a good profile. Eight two three is kind of mediocre. Oh, I was talking about the twin fusion that you take up top with the. I see, yep. I see. I see. The collider yes, is yes, strength yes. twelve. Strength thirteen is not really needed, um, but you can run. I think this ion raker gains a lot. I I think the ghost kill with cyclic ion raker and twin fusion is legitimately very good in that detachment yep. because it is annoying to remove. It's a big roadblock, and. With the Cyclic Iron Raker, it actually does legitimate damage. Mm -hmm. Like this thing with a Stealth Suit unit pointing at you, the Ghost Kill shoots you, you're taking real damage from long range. Mm -hmm. I mean, you get the big benefit up close, but you're doing consistent chip at long range. And then up close, you can actually drop the hammer at 933. And then that's pretty scary. And then the fact it's a lone op with a two up with blank two, two uh, attacks mm -hmm. to the unit is really scary. Like, legitimately, I think this guy is living up to the potential I saw in him when the Index first came out. Yep. And with the buffs from the Retaliation Cadre, he's just really good. Just very solid unit. So uh, I think we'll definitely be seeing them, especially because Anva is gone now. If you want to access a loan op, you go to Shadow Sun, or you can go to the Ghost Keel. There's a couple other ones, but I think those are the best two. Also, you keep the fallback, you take the fallback and shoot. Yep. Because you lose smoke, but checks notes you already have stealth. Why? Why would you have the smoke keyword? Because you get cover. Sure. <laughs> With the strategy in tenth edition, everyone has cover. Yeah, I, I, I don't know. <laughs> but the fact you can fall back and shoot means your opponent charges you. You can still blank two of the failed saves, or not failed saves. Blank two of the attacks before you take the saves. That's yep. still pretty big. And then you are still toughness eight with a two up twelve wounds. It's pretty tough. And then you fall back and shoot someone from up close with the retaliation cadre. 
this feels really, really strong there. Yep. I don't, I mean, like, I, I think it's really good. Then we have the Pathfinder team. This one is um, basically the same. You still get to observe twice. You can still put the Infiltrator uh, ability on them with the Recon Drone. So just a very good skirmisher. Um, and I like them. And they, they open up, if you want to observe a lot of different things, they open up being able to just give a lot of things while some ballistic skill. Yep. Uh, then we've got uh, a Firesight team is still terrible. It's just <laughs> garbage. It's a lone op, but like there's better lone ops to take, although no on Va anymore. The long shot pulse rifles are embarrassing. Yeah, it's it's not good. And then because it's a unit that doesn't lead, it can't get it can't just sit there as a lone op with any of those um, like Monka or Kalyun um, enhancements. Yeah. Then you've got Vespid Stingwings. They didn't change its rules somehow. It's still end of your movement phase, not end of your opponent's turn. Okay. It's good I at screening out rapid ingress. I feel like there was a like lack of uh, proofreading on, on some of this stuff. It, it, it has the unique ability of being able to screen out a rapid ingress. You run it's, forward. You, you came up with this. Yeah. You run forward. They have to drop down. And then once they're done dropping down with the rapid, you can pull the unit and put it into strap reserves. Yeah, I used it a couple times. It's cute, but it's it's still not really worth the unit because it doesn't observe things and, and other stuff. So. I, agreed. So. Its gun is mediocre. It's okay, but it doesn't get any of the buffs of the army. All right, crew, let's go. Okay, here we go, Jack. All right, go ahead, baby. Here All right, go. revving up the engines. Let's 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 blaze into this one. So we got the Trail Shaper. Um, currently reloading his gun, I think, or it's just broken. Is he's reloading it? Yeah, it looks like he's reloading. It's like a it's a breech loader. He's got the load in his the hand, the bullet in his hand. Yeah. Okay. So in combat, garbage and shooting, garbage. Not really the point. Um, three wounds, toughness three mall with a six up. It's durability is not really the point either. Let's find out what the point is. Uh, infiltrates, scout seven, stealth. Not bad. I assume that's the same as a decent amount of the units. Yep. Uh, once per turn, when an enemy unit ends a normal advance or fallback move within nine, uh, the bear's unit can, or the his unit can move D6, which is all right. It's cute, but not, if it was the normal move, it would be quite good. Yes. After both players have deployed their army and determined who's go first, you can redeploy this small's unit and another friendly crew unit. Okay, that is, that's pretty decent. You have a redeploy after you know who's going first, and it's this guy's unit and then, like, a, probably a unit of the, the Rampagers. Yeah. And thanks to the rules commentary, you can use that on infiltrating units. Okay. So, I mean, that that's pretty interesting. You could even take a couple, like... If you really wanted to, you could take three of these idiots, three of these ding dongs, and then you could redeploy three rampager units wherever you wanted. Yeah, uh, that's that's interesting. That is that is interesting. Don't then, look at the points. <laughs> oh, that's gonna make me sad. Hold on, crew trail shaper fifty five. It's not great. I don't think it needs to go down a ton, but like yeah, you'll, you'll see it. Thirty five, forty points. I think would be would be a good point cost for him. I think 40 would be decent because the because he gives it to a second unit and himself, which is a redeploy for that, is pretty good. Crew War Shaper, this guy's my boy. He yeah, does he's got the, the dart bow and the tri blade. It, listen, with dev wounds and precision, that is actually a good weapon. Without that, it is not. Um, and then in combat, he has you know with he hits on fours, by the way. In shooting, he does, yeah. yes. Um, once per battle round, one unit from your army with this ability can target the strat for zero. Um, and then once per battle, at the start of any phase, you can select one friendly crew unit that is battle shock. And then 12, it's not battle shock. Wow, that's not great. Really this doing... Was, War Leader, once again, was almost certainly written in the time where you can free strat any stratagem. So you could have blown up. You could use the lone op strap for zero CP multiple times. Oh, that would be sick. Instead, that's probably they're... how it was designed, but now we live in data slate world. Where Wait, they... hold on. The, the bring a unit back to life strat is a battle tactic. Can be targeted with the strat, so you can target it with that. So if he is in a unit that dies, yes. that unit will come back for free. So it's carnivore, so he can be in the 20-man. Uh, that is legitimately good. Him, yeah, him I mean, saying, I'm saying, but they originally designed it, I imagine, oh, yeah, such to that use the rest of those. Of them. That would be pretty good. Um, he can also use the trap well laid for free, and even if you've already done it. And the fact that this can be um, used even if you've already targeted it means you can bring back two units a turn. That means that the recruit war shaper, who is very expensive, is still pretty good. <laughs> how, many, how many points? He's do they sixty put in the... points. Okay. So he is still pretty good because he reads if I'm joined to a twenty man, that twenty man comes back to life when you kill it. And if you have multiple Warshapers, 
you can bring multiple units back to life in the same turn. On the strat, did they put a restriction on targeting the same unit? I don't think so. I don't think there's a restriction. I'll find out. I don't think so, but I just want to check. Uh, no. There's okay. no there's no restriction. So obviously when he... Because it's a new unit identical. He does not he, come back with come the back, unit. But you, you can have three of these guys with 320 men's. Yep, and if you kill two of them, those two, back to life. It'll cost you two CP to do it, because two for the first one, zero for the second. But, like, you can bring back two crew units every turn and one for free. Um, it's, it's pretty good. Like, legitimately, that is worth doing, even if he is one of the biggest taxiest taxes I've ever seen. <laughs> he also can be the... If his unit shoots at you for free, you can do the plus one AP. And with the way that that works, somebody else can shoot you, spend one. He can shoot you, spend zero. And then, bink... Uh, plus two AP against that target. So the Warshaper is pretty good. Yep. Uh, the free strats are the ones you would want, uh, and the bringing unit back to life is just the good one. So you're taking him. And if you are taking him, you're probably taking the uh, root carved weapons <laughs> to make his bow just like randomly bink, bink, snipe out the Technomancer and shoot him, because it absolutely can do that. Um, yeah, he's interesting. Bringing unit back to life for free, good. Mm-hmm. Flush Shaper has, uh, yep, yeah, we're not talking about the weapons. They're not good. Um, but while this model's leading a unit, melee weapons get sustained one, which is good. So that is, I think that's probably the guy, yes, that can get uh, crit fives. So you'd have sustained fives on the unit. That's really strong. And then while this model is leading a unit, models in the unit have Feel the Pain six plus, And if that unit destroys one or more enemy units, they get Feel the Pain five plus. I thought that was just their data sheet ability. Uh, so they switched it around. That used to be uh, the Grizzly Feast that they had. Okay. So they, they swapped it. So that was like the generic Shaper had that, and now it's just on him. I see. Okay. I mean, it's not bad. Yeah. It's I fine. Mean, killing stuff in combat isn't that easy. <laughs> uh, I mean, they have sustained fives. It would have been better if it were lethal fives, but it is not. Oh, my God, that is a bad weapon. <laughs> uh, he can join Far Stalkers. Um... And he probably wants to. Uh, wow, those are uh, those are also really just bad weapons. <laughs> just really not good weapons to be adding sustained fives to. Uh, the flesh shaper's trash. Um, yeah, he's really bad. <laughs> you're going to you're going to jump through a bunch of hoops to hand bonus damage to a unit that still does zero damage. Turns out zero. <laughs> <laughs> zero damage with sustained hits on fives is still zero damage. Cool. It's asymptotic to zero. <laughs> so, All right. the Crute Lone Spear is actually a good unit. Yes, Crute Lone Spear, you're paying for him. It's the one Crute unit that I know the cost is like 110, right? It's, uh, so, once again, I don't know who did the points at the end, at the beginning of the book. It was somebody who wrote it at the beginning and had no idea what any of these should be worth. And so, obviously, they're nonsense, but like, the crew have to use those points for now until the MFM, which is unfortunate. Yeah. If the MFM comes out and has a real points cost, so this guy being 110 is wild. I, I, um, I don't know how. I, I really don't know how a human brain uh, decided. But <laughs> let's point. talk about what he does <laughs> and then just assume he'll receive a reasonable points cost in the future. Yes, because I think he is actually a good data sheet. All right, so the crew Lone Spear is Toughness 5 with 6 wounds and a 5-up, so he's not that durable, but he does have some amount of wounds, mm -hmm. right? Like, 4 attacks at damage 1 will not kill him, for example, unlike most of the other characters. Uh, he is OC 2, he moves 12. Every time he is Lone Up, he scouts, he has stealth. Each time this model makes a ranged attack that hits an enemy unit, until the end of the turn, every other crew model from your army makes an attack against that unit you reroll hits. So every time mm -hmm. he makes a ranged attack that hits... Every attack in shooting or combat for the rest of your crew army will reroll hits. That S is good. Sidonian Scatros eat your heart out. That's a rule. That is a hell of a rule. And you can take multiples of them and huck your stupid blast javelins all over the live long place. He can only take three total. He also has one gun that is 36 inch range. So he can shoot it, hit a target, and just go, hey, uh, does he even need to hit? He needs to hit, yes. Yeah. Um, he does hit on fours, but man, we're going to CP reroll. Whoa, that. he can split fire and get real hits against everything. Because he, he has two guns, he can split fire. He fires long gun somewhere and his blast javelin somewhere else, 
and every time he hits a unit with it, that unit gets real hits from yeah, the rest of the Yeah, and you can have three of these lone dudes. Yep. And so they can all... So you can get up to six full hit rerolls against enemy units. Then you look at the weapon profile. <laughs> they need it. Okay? <laughs> they need it. But that is a hell of a buff. Um, big fan yeah, of that. He, he is great. In your shooting phase, after it is shot, it can make a normal move up to six. Yep, he's got fire and fade as well, so you keep him... He's a lone up with fire and fade. It's good. Yep. Decent range. His guns are surprisingly not bad for crude. Might be why they gave him 110 points on the points cost. Um, <laughs> but he's a heavy precision damage three gun. You won't use it as precision, just you might pick a guy off. He has a blast javelin that is 10 2 2 for some reason. Which is the reason. one enhancement that isn't locked to a particular shaper? Because he's a character, so he could take the first one, I think. Yeah, the first one is the 12 inch no deep strikeies. Yeah. Which is really good on, on a loan up. On a fire and fade loan up. A fire and fade loan up that you can't get within 12 inches of is legitimately wild. It gives him ignores cover, too. It <laughs> sure does <laughs> on his blast javelin, which is not a bad weapon, all things considered. Especially if, like, a second lone spear throws a spear at something, and then the other lone spears reroll hits against that target. Yeah. I could it's, actually see them doing it's real a damage. Decent, it's one of the better profiles in here for crude. Uh, yes, and then he has a lot of... Um, oh, I see. Okay, so he either has a long gun or a blast javelin and a hunting javelin. So he cannot target multiple units. He either has a long you gun too excited. or a blast javelin. <laughs> and you're almost certainly taking the blast javelin because... It's uh, a better weapon. <laughs> it's a better weapon. You don't want to just miss on a target because you have multiple shots. A D6 plus blast. I guess the other one is heavy, heavy uh, so you go to hitting on twos with it. If you stand still. Yeah, but it's 36-inch range as well. The other one's assault, so you get to like advance Frankly, and huck it. Yeah, you probably take the other one anyway, but still. Yeah. It is... Uh, Damn, I was really hoping. What keyed me in was that you have a close combo weapon and a hunting javelin and a calamandra's bite. And yeah. I was like, that doesn't seem right. So yes, uh, unfortunately, too much hype. Too much hype. You but can't target multiple things. You can get rerolls on three units. You can get rerolls on three units, which is a dude that points at a target and says, my army gets rerolled to hit yeah, against uh, it in shooting and combat is really good. Imagine the Sidonian Scatchers just had that rule. That would be a good, good rule. Yes. Now he has 110 points. So you're probably taking one and giving him the Crute Hawk Flock, but uh, hopefully once, he'll be cheaper. <laughs> once they give him a real points cost, he'll take them. All right, carnivores, Crute Carnies. Not a single weapon has an a has a pip of AP on it, but they got a big data sheet upgrade. Uh, they sticky objectives. Yep. So that's really helpful for regular Tau. Less so for <laughs> less right. so for the Crute Detachment. I'll tell you that much. Regular Tau are going to grab a Crute unit minimum. Um, they have a lot of weapons that have a lot of different profiles, and I'm just not intrigued by trying to you, delve into how little damage they do. You can take do. two shapers in their unit. It's fine. I mean, <laughs> you can't attach two of the same, which you weren't going to do. But, like, a trail shaper and a war shaper is not bad. The unit moves and then comes back to life. But I think just a war shaper yeah. and a 20-man, so that when it dies, it comes back to life. Is about but you could get those sustains it. crit fives. Yeah, you could get sustains crit fives on your weapons, I suppose. I mean, at a certain point, at a certain point, it is forty attacks, but like it's forty garbage attacks. I'm just not interested in that. <laughs> um, Krutok's riders is have it? a what is it? Repeater cannon or a tangle cannon? Mm -hmm. The tangle cannon is D six plus. When are we going to get AP? <laughs> My God. <laughs> the repeater cannon is 36-inch range rapid fire 2 at 712. All right, we found our first pip of AP. Very <laughs> proud of these guys. <laughs> it's on that repeater cannon, baby. Uh, grenades are going to do most, most of the heavy lifting in this army. Anyway, uh, within 18, it's going to be rapid fire 2, so four shots. If you're rerolling hits against the target, this gun is not terrible. It's fine. It's not, certainly not worth 40 points a model, <laughs> but it is, sorry, I had to find it. Uh, it's certainly not worth 40 points a model, but it is a decent gun. I assume when they go down to like a reasonable points cost, then you will see them. Because four shots at 712 per guy in a unit of up to three that rerolls hits, legitimately, not terrible. Um, but at 40 points a model, legitimately terrible. Uh, and then once per turn in your opponent's shooting phase, when friendly crew infantry within six is selected as a target of an attack, 
one unit with from your army with this ability can use it, and after they're done sh making their attacks, you get to shoot as if it was your shooting phase, which is okay. The tangle cannon is really bad because it's six zero one. <laughs> You're gonna take the repeater cannon, and then it's okay in combat. Four attacks a piece at six one two with two attacks off the dude who sucks. Yep, I really wish they just made melee weapons on all the crude AP one at the very least, just improve the AP by one. Yeah. <laughs> but I could see Crutox Riders at 30 points being quite good. Because, like, decent damage in combat. Not amazing, but decent. Decent damage in shooting. Not amazing, but decent. Decent durability. Not amazing, but decent. 30 points? Okay. I'd be all about that. Yeah. I, it's just right now, you look at some of the other 30-point models, and you're like, wow, how is this 10 points more? Yeah. I mean, like 30 points for a Blade Guard compared to a Crutox Rider... The Kronox Rider is better at 30. Like, legitimately, is better than a Blade Guard at 30, I think. Um, toughness 6 with 5 wounds is, is likely just better than the durability they have. And you hit about as hard, plus 1 strength, minus 1 less AP. And you have a gun. Like, I could definitely see this. And Blade Guard are, are, are standing on decent territory. Like, they're indecent. Mm -hmm. uh, I could definitely see Kronox Riders at 30 or 35 being reasonable. 40 seems a bit excessive. All right, uh, heading over to the Kroot Rampagers, brand new. All right, so the Kroot Rampager, and you know I like to rampage. <laughs> so the Kroot Rampager is the same defensive profile as Krutox Riders, toughness 6, 5 up save, 5 wounds, which is okay. It's not amazing. It's going to die. You're just going to die a little slower than your opponent might want. Yep. That's about it, um, which is a valuable place to be. But, you know, uh, in combat, it has no shooting to speak of, pretty much. It has, like, some pistols, so it can shoot while it's in combat, which is nice. And they're assault. So it can do actions while it's in combat. It can advance in action. Do okay. like all that. Um, yeah, the actual damage of the shooting attack, we don't get into that. But the fact it can do actions, that's sick. Um, hunting blades are 411 lance. Rampager fists are 612 sustained extra attacks. It's okay. And then every I really time thought the, the melee guy would like slap in melee. He is huge. He, he's a rampager. Rampager fists <laughs> AP one. Um, <laughs> but yeah, something like eight two two would have been pretty would have been pretty appropriate. But mm, whatever. Each time this unit ends a charge move, select one enemy unit within engagement range and roll a d six for every model in this unit that is within engagement range. And on four, they take uh, d three mortal wounds. And then they have to take a battle shock if you've killed a model from that. Yep, and this is where you're going to do, like Jack said, you're going to get a lot of damage out of grenades and charge it. <laughs> yep, with charge portals. portals and all that. <laughs> and then these guys, I believe, are at the truly ridiculous points cost of 43 points a model. <sighs> <sighs> Which would you rather have? Siegs, would you rather have six of these guys or six Inceptors? Same points cost. <laughs> <laughs> Up to you. Now, once again, we are just teasing the points. They are not legitimate in the back of the book. It tells you use the MFM, and there will be, will be an updated MFM for this book. It's just, we're going to have to wait for it. If they come out with real points costs for the Crute Rampager and the Crute Ox Rider, they are reasonable, well, all decent the units. Need real points. All the Crute need real yeah. points. Uh, the characters need real points. I assume the Crute Carnivores are fine. They No, they went up like a lot. Damn, they're 85 <laughs> points a mile, or 85 points a unit? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So they need um, real points costs for the crude stuff. That is coming down like 20% across the board at least. Some of the units need a little more than that. Crutox rider, uh, Riders at 30 points a model would be legitimately good, I think. Crutox uh, Rampagers at 40 points a model, 35, I think 35. I think 35 would be reasonable. It's not even. At 40 is too much. But 35, I think, would be reasonable. 210 for six of them running around. How many points is blood are blood crushers? You don't want to know that, my friend. I'll find out. Because th this should be cheaper than a blood crusher. I'll look it up. Because blood crushers are a bit similar, right? But they hit harder in combat. By like a good margin of character support. <clears throat> Let's find out. Because that's the analog is what I'm thinking, is that this is like a... Cheaper, less durable version of Blood Crusher, so it has to be cheaper than them. Yeah, Blood Crusher are toughness seven. I have four wounds, but with a four pin vol means they're substantially tougher. Uh oh yeah, you don't know that. Okay. Um What's their points? One ten for three. <laughs> 
and blood crushers are not lighting the world on fire right now. No, so like this needs to be cheaper than that. Yeah, I could definitely see 30 points a model for both. Yeah, I, I really think it needs to be that low. I mean, legitimately, the Crutox Rider might be better than the Rampager per model, because at least it has a gun, right? Its combat is... The Crudox Rampager has sustained, and in instead of that, the Rider has a gun that is not horrible, because a lot of the time when you shoot, you're going to reroll hits. So, 30 points small for each. I think totally reasonable. There's just a, there is a big AP problem here, though. Big AP, big strength problem. Yeah. <laughs> big damage to problem. I think they're, yeah. I, <laughs> they, they need real points cost. Yeah. Crude Hounds, uh, so they got that nice upgrade there where if they're within uh, 12 of a friendly crude character, they get plus one OC. Or if you just take Monka, which you do conquer, they can get plus one OC on that objective, which is nice. And then if they start the command phase within six of a crude infantry, they can advance a charge, which whatever about that, but it's a, a cheap cheap unit. Yes. And we got Far Stalkers. They are still a good infiltrating unit, um, but they're competing with Pathfinders who have a lot more synergy with the main Tau units, but they're, they're reasonably good. A bunch of dudes who can string out all over the place and move block for relatively cheap. They have good. very few weapons that have a point of AP. It's not about the damage. <laughs> At some point, an army has to have some amount of damage. It's in the t actual Tau units. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I the crew detachment would have been so cool if just you could make crew do any amount of damage at all. And I, I do think that this will be looked at at some point. So I hope that uh, Josh and the EV balance team actually look at it for a data slate to, for some weapon upgrades. Because crew are super cool, and they do no damage, <laughs> even with all of the upgrades you have. You're not making two attacks at four zero one do something you're just not no. so like uh, i don't care how much how many buffs you put on it that base profile is too garbage for me to care yeah it's like the thing is uh let's think about jakari with incubi like they had nerfs from 9th to 10th on their weapon profiles and they had to get access to extra ap full reels to hit end wound and lance and now we're starting to talk about a decent unit yeah now they're now they're a good unit. Yeah, they do damage, but they still struggle to do damage into a wide variety of targets. They're really, really good into killing like marines or vehicles on invuln or things like that. And their, their base is starting at a little bit higher than this. And that three attacks at four two two, I would yeah. kill to start there. We're starting exactly. two attacks at four zero one, um, and giving it sustained fives. That's a hell of a rule. I. I'm not going to care. <laughs> like, legitimately, what they need to do is they need to hand them a point of AP across the board, and they need to hand them lethal hits on everything. And then lethal fives, lethal sustained fives, is good enough to get you there in a decent amount of scenarios. But, like, I don't know, man. Yeah. Okay. So moving on to the other stuff, the piranhas remain uh, basically exactly the same. Still able to give those battle shocks end of your movement phase broadsides. Somehow kept the Feel No Pain 4 plus against Mortal Wounds. Once again, this was just had to be written at the beginning of the edition when yep. that rule was much more impactful. Yep. Um, I, if you are not a custodian, your 4 up against Mortal Wounds does not apply to Death Wounds. They didn't make a blanket change. They made a very specific one to just custodies. Yeah, and should broadsides have this anyway? No, they should have something else. So yes. It's just whatever. Uh, Riptide did not get the upgrade on the Ion Accelerator that I was really hoping for, but... In the Retaliation Cadre, you do get a nice buff. I will say, in the Retaliation Cadre, being Strength 9, AP 4, Damage 4 is a hell of a profile. Yep. I'm just saying. Also, the Heavy Burst Cannon being 722 is not as good because it's only 12 shots. What are we doing? But, um, yeah, the, the Ion Accelerator being 944 with 6 shots is spicy. Yep. Legitimately, it's... Very, very good if it's within six of the target. Aww. It is quite tough as well. So in the retaliation cadre, just having riptides, they can't fall back and they can fall back and shoot. Yeah, they can. They have the battle suit support. And Dude, that is monsters. scary. That's really scary, man. I just have to tell you that as as someone who doesn't want to get shot by that, in the retaliation cadre, riptides are going to do work. 
Yep. And uh, SMS is not bad there either because you go to strain six AP1. You do have to be within six inches of the target. Yeah, then... but if you're playing them aggressive, which you're already probably doing anyway, True. you can actually like lean on an Eldar player that's trying to stage a bunch of nonsense. It could work for sure. Yep. Um, Twin Fusion also just being 10, 5, D6 plus, you know, yep. plus two is also really good. And then uh, it is equipped with... Equipped with it has both weapon and battle suit, so it yep. ignores modifiers to hit, and it can fall back and shoot. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think I think it's I think it gets a lot scarier in the retaliation cadre in a way it did not get really with Kalyon. because Kalyon has to wait. Retaliation cadre, it does not. Yep. Then heading over to the hammerhead, same exact thing. Basically, all the profiles are quite similar here. You're not going to see me gushing about going to strength 21 AP6 in the Retaliation Cadre? Well, it's not a battle suit. Oh, there's multiple reasons you're not going to see that. <laughs> um, the Sky Raid does get a nice little upgrade here in that its secret missile rack becomes twin-linked. Uh, oh, that is a big deal. Because uh, otherwise, the hammerhead kind of outperforms it with uh, the pluses to hit against monsters' vehicles. Did it used to be D3 plus one shots? Uh, I believe it was D3 plus one now at it's some just... point. I'll um, double check. I think it was D3 plus one, but not blast. Okay. Uh, sky Ray. The Ray of Skies. Nope, it was three. It was three. Okay. That was the previous edition, I guess. But yeah, it's exactly the same except twin linked instead of not, which is a huge change. Huge it's change. A, it's a big consistency change, and I think it's, and, it's a solid. And it rerolls hits against fly, so it just rerolls hits and wounds. Against, against fly. fly targets, that's yeah. strong. Your has got some storm ravens, you'll, you'll kill them. <laughs> All right, Devilfish uh, keeps its ability to uh, be able to disembark your unit after you advance, which is super nice. You can throw the gun drones on there to get the advance, and otherwise it is basically the same. Uh, the planes, pretty much the same. Storm Surge, also basically the same here. And the tide wall, you cannot pay me enough to uh, review it. I am pretty sure they're the same as well. So... That is the rules in this book. Uh, tactical drones are removed as well. You can't take drones separately anymore, although that was a wildly overcosted unit anyway, and nobody took it, but you can't. So Crisis Commander gone. You got Anshi, Anva gone as well as the uh, tactical drones. So decent amount of stuff disappears. Long Strike as well disappears in this book. So, you know, handful of the named characters, which is a little sad because Long Strike was one of the hammerheads that was seen the most often. But regular hammerheads are, are still fine at their uh, current MFM points cost. Overall, I think that uh, the detachments that you gain, Manka and the Retaliation Cadre, are significantly better than Kalyon, in my opinion. Not simply because it loses Strike and Fade, but because they allow you to act in ways in the early terms that help influence the game in much more impactful ways. Yep, absolutely. So I, I mean, I'm pretty, pretty enthusiastic about this book. Obviously, the Crute stuff was the stuff we ended on. Yeah, that stuff is garbage. It's just bad. <laughs> um, but the new detachments are really strong, and I think the Tau is positioned right now to really use Montca and Retaliation Cadre to just blow people up. Yep, is uh, Tau needed stuff where if your opponent rushes you down, you're able to say no. Yeah, Retaliation Cadre, you're rushing into, you're making it much easier for the Retaliation Cadre to just go, plus one strength, plus one AP, Brat! and then you're dead. <laughs> and now you don't have to rely as heavily on Tetras, because you have uh, three by three stealth suits, it's going to be quite common, and Shadow Sun might be the loan up you replace Anva with, and so you'll have reroll ones in another place. And when you throw a couple Ghost Keels, a couple Riptides together, some of the Sun Forge uh, battle suits, the Crisis suits... That's a lot of damage very quickly. It's a lot of damage. They're not that expensive, mm -hmm. right? The the Riptide's 165 currently. In the book, I'm sure it's like 3,000, but... It's, uh, his original cost was 245, I think, so that's probably what it is, or it's around there. I'd be interested to know. But 165 is a, honestly, to my mind, ridiculous points cost for them. Um, especially if you can get plus one strength, plus one AP on their weapon. Their weapon really likes hitting break points like that. A Riptide, yeah, 245. So yeah, this is nonsense points <laughs> uh, in here. But I think the Sunforge is really good. I think it's cheap and it's effective. Um, I think that Riptide's are really good in Retaliation Cadre. I think Stealth Suits, I think um, Ghost Kills, all really good. Really get a lot more consistent. Strength 8 going to Strength 9, AP 2 and 3 going to AP 3 and 4 is 
huge break points. Yes, your opponent rushes you with like devilfish or trucks or rhinos. They're going to get themselves killed. That you will all of a sudden hit the break point where you're like, no, you're dead. Yeah. And then you have a bunch of really good abilities to fire and fade around for basically free. Like I feel like I'm committing theft anytime <laughs> anytime I use a 1 CP fire and fade. Like somebody stop me. I'm cheating. Torch Star Gambit, baby. It's 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 going to gambit all over some people. So I'm really excited. I think Monka plays the mission style that I've been doing with like 60 to 80 or 90 infantry extremely well. If you want to play the Devilfish, you're going to overload primary and throw bodies all over the table. I think Monka plays that super well. And if you like broadsides a lot, I think the detachment really supports them as well in ways that the other ones don't. Uh, and then in terms of the retaliation contra, I think just an aggressive battlesuit army like the Monster Mash, although they're not monsters anymore, is uh, certainly viable. And probably quite strong. It pro yeah, I, I would imagine that it is. Like I said, we haven't been spamming games because uh, it's been a recent uh, access to these rules, thanks to Games Workshop. We have not but, actually put this army on the table yet, but, but I'm when excited I, to do so. When I look at it, the best data sheets in here were not edited in ways that made them worse. Some armies got their best data sheets tweaked down, like uh, Cataphron Breachers. Or Lich Guard. Or Lich Guard. And so that fundamentally didn't happen here. Breachers are still awesome. Crisis suits are different, but I honestly think it's better for Tau overall because Tau want to be an MSU army. They don't want to have to rely on a 500-point brick to carry the game. They want units all over the place that all do things, and this book does that, which is really powerful in yes, my opinion. Yes, it's really, it's really quite strong. Um, you also get, as you said, like some, some walkers that are really cheap. Like really cheap. You can spam the hell out of broad, out of uh, not broadsides, riptides and ghost scales. Yep, stealth suits. You got your commanders and crisis suit units. You're gonna have a lot of beef on the table. All of it annoying to kill, and it's gonna do a lot of damage when your opponent tries to overload you immediately. Yep. Mm -hmm. and that's that's the thing Tau was missing, and they finally get it in this book. So I think a lot of Tau players, once they get past losing some of the data sheets and the crisis unit being changed and having to rip all your cyclic ion blasters off will actually be happy with the underlying core of this book, which is quite strong, yep. in my opinion. I, I think the book's great. I It definitely, uh, you know, Anvar, rest in pieces. Uh, <laughs> um, but, and the big six-man crisis brick, that's gone. But I think that Montcon and the Retaliation Cadre are super worth it. And I think a lot of the, the data sheet changes are side grades. Yeah, so yeah. I'm excited to play with the new styles. Like I said, I'm going to be playing uh, plenty of the different detachments, although the Crute detachment is going to be in Nick's realm. Yeah, at least, uh, that detachment sounds... <laughs> well, <sighs> even if it gets real points, it's still not like a real army. There's just nothing there to work with, right? Yeah, There's need, just nothing there to work you with. You need a greater Narlog. You need some of the bigger things that can like punch up. You just needed like the Rampager to go to AP2 strength 8. You needed the, the Crew Talk Shrier to be strength to AP2 in shooting. Right, you needed the, the basic crew to be AP one and maybe strength five, right? So to have some kind of base, right? You needed the shapers to have better, even better rules. Like the war shaper needs to have his current rule, and then also say, hey, in combat, they're plus one strength, plus one AP. Yeah, you needed like nutty rules if you're starting with that baseline, or you give them a good baseline. Because rules are multiplicative. And if you start with a low number, the multipliers, even if they are ridiculous, will still end you with a low number. Um, so that's how it works. If you start out with a good data sheet and you add little incremental incre increases, those incremental increases are still huge because you started with a big, you know, with a big number. But if you start with one and you multiply it by three, that's three. <laughs> if you start with ten, you multiply it by three, that's thirty, right? So it uh, it ends up being like plus 20 instead of plus two. That's basically the way it works with, with buffs on units. If you start out with a garbage spot, you need you need to basically have enough buffs that you've reinvented the unit. Yep. And that, that just has not happened. That's not happening here. So I I don't think we're going to see too much of the crude army as a legitimate competitive option. But if you want to have fun with it, it definitely has fun rules. Yes, uh, for so sure. That's nice. For sure. But the two serious detached, I think Monka and uh, Retaliation Cadre are going to be quite competitive. Kalyun, I, I think it's going to fall off quite a bit. If you like that style, you can still play it, and you can still work really hard to win games with it, but I think the other two detachments really do outshine it. Yep, and I'm excited for those, because I think they play 40k in a more interesting way than They play 10th edition. Yeah. They're 10th edition detachments. They just, Kalyun just doesn't play 40k. 
doesn't play modern the 40K. way that 40k wants like you to you give me play. that detachment in eighth edition i'm swimming yeah of course but you get it in ninth edition the beginning of ninth edition you have to the last stranglehold you yeah. know raise the banners you do you do pretty good with it but now in 10th edition not so much Anyway, I think that is it for us for today. Well, thank you so much, Mr. Jack, for joining me here, and hope everybody enjoyed this breakdown of the Tau Codex. Please give, give us a like, subscribe to the channel, tell your friends about us, and leave a comment below letting us know what you've enjoyed most about the review, what you're most excited for in your Tau armies, and uh, just overall how you're doing, because we really appreciate that. I will be reading the comments. And uh, in addition, if you want to see more Tau content, there are going to be games in the War Room uh, being released alongside this review and in the future coming weeks. So if you want to see Tau games played with Monka with the Retaliation re retaliation Cadre, don't worry, it's going to be in there. And uh, we're going to be playing lots and lots of games. I'm going to be doing full reviews and eventually a masterclass on this as well. So please do look forward to that. And thanks so much for joining us. Really appreciate your support. And for the Tauva, uh, go ahead and enjoy these rules and start thinking about all the amazing things you can do with this codex. So thanks so much, everybody. See you next time. Bye-bye.